With the wealth of online information available, new mushroom cultivators are able to find success quicker than ever before. As people flood into this community hoping to find quality information so they can grow their own medicine, there will be a rapidly growing segment of this community who go from novice to expert in record time. But once you learn how to grow them all, I mean, what's next? Can you go further down the rabbit hole of mycology? Of course you can. Tonight, we take a look back into the Myco Geeky podcast archives to explore the methodology of one of the great living mushroom breeders in our community. Grab your notebook and pen and put on your thinking caps. We're granted an exclusive peek into the mind of one of today's most prolific and amazing cultivators. Stay tuned as he teaches us how to truly isolate traits and chase down phenotypes. Join me as we step into the next level of cultivation with the one and only Dave Wombat. You're listening to the Myco Geeky Podcast. A podcast that inspires people to grow mushrooms at home to improve their mental, emotional, and physical health. Most people call him geeky, and he is a passionate mushroom cultivator, advocate, and educator. Every week, he sits down with fellow cultivators, mushroom educators, scientists, and therapists to discuss the various ways people can approach mushroom cultivation and how mushrooms can be used to improve their lives. All right, what's up, guys? Welcome to the Myco Geeky Podcast, the podcast that goes deep so you can level up your at-home mushroom cultivation game. I'm your host, Myco Geeky, and uh, we're doing something a little different tonight. This is a new one for me. Uh, you know, it's only been a year, but we're going to do a rerun tonight. Um, so as you guys might know, I have uh, recently started putting all the podcasts uh, up on audio podcast platforms like Spotify, uh, iTunes, things like that. And um, as I'm going back to some of the older podcasts, there are some audio issues. So of course, I, I, I've gotten, I think, eight or nine episodes up there so far. I'm going to slowly be unrolling these episodes, uh, you know, just, just every month, try to get another maybe 10 up there. And, uh, but I wanted to go back there. My absolute all time great episode is the Dave Wombat episode. And, uh, but man, that, that had some audio problems, uh, some audio problems that are probably beyond my ability to fix, but I tried. Um, and I think I made quite a bit of improvement to the, to the segment with, with Dave. So, uh, we're going to rerun it tonight. Uh, before we get into that. I uh, want to shout out my Patreon supporters. You guys are amazing. Um, really appreciate you guys. Can't say, can't, can't really emphasize how um, important you guys are for keeping this going for me. Um, it, it, it's just, uh, man, <laughs> uh, uh, I'm beating a dead horse here. But uh, YouTube, it's not nice to me. Uh, it doesn't like what I'm talking about, uh, or somebody out there decides to, you know, let the cat out of the bag. Uh, either way, as soon as these things get published, uh, they get demonetized immediately. I can fight it and every once in a blue moon, I, I win one and I'll get it remonetized. But for the most part, they're not. Um, so Patreon is really the way if you value this content, if every week you love tuning in, if you, if you're new to the show and, and you're like, wow, this is amazing. I'm learning so much a way you can show me your support is just going to Patreon five bucks a month, 10 bucks a month, 25 bucks a month. However you are able or feel compelled to support. I appreciate it. Um, again, for those of you guys who don't know, uh, you can just go to patreon.com backslash Michael geeky. If you're on your phone app, um, you have to actually go like into a web browser, search Myco Geeky Patreon, then it will pull up. You can't like search within the app. So anyway, thank you so much for considering that. I appreciate it. Uh, around the holidays, um, doesn't hurt to get a little support. Definitely the, the, the time to give, right? That's what they say. Anyway, uh, our, our mission has never been clearer. Um, we are here to teach people who want to experience the medicinal value of mushrooms um, by growing them in their own home. That's, that's what we're here for. Um, uh, we, we had the mission statement up a little earlier. I'm going to pull it back up just, just so we can, you know, beat a dead horse on this one. 
I want to educate and inspire mushroom cultivators and enthusiasts on the art and science of mushroom cultivation. We're also going to delve into the medicinal, therapeutic, and societal aspects of mushrooms, including discussions on integration therapy, spirituality, and the decriminalization movement. We um, have done a couple integration episodes recently. Those have gone over really well. A lot of people uh, messaging me afterwards saying, I love this content. I want more of this content. Please keep doing it. Don't worry. We're going to keep doing it. Uh, I also want to announce that uh, hopefully over the winter here, going to have a little bit more time. Uh, we're going to work on some actual content, not podcast content. It, it will be formal um, educational content ar around mushroom cultivation. Um, I think I got a little something special to say. I've talked to a lot of people and I've absorbed a lot of information. I've synthesized a lot of information and uh, I have a unique way of growing that we're going to get into and we're going to explore. I'm going to show you my tips and tricks kind of the same way that Ed Grand just showed up on the scene and said, Hey, I'm just going to show you guys what I do. Um, we're, we're, we're going to do a little bit of that, do it the geeky way. Um, so anyway, stay tuned for that. Um, hope everybody's having a good holiday season. Um, and, uh, if there was ever a time to kind of step back to one of the early episodes and, uh, just get a refresher here, I, I think this is a good one. Um, Man, the amount of information in this two and a half hour segment cannot be underappreciated. Dave just showed up a year ago and just said, I'm just going to tell everybody how I do this. I'm going to tell you how I think about it. I'm going to tell you how I find what I'm looking for. And uh, man, going through and re-editing this and uh, trying to fix up the audio, I, I got a chance to re-listen to it again. And I'm like, God dang, this 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 is why this was this is the top podcast. So uh without further ado, let's let's jump right into the uh to the segment where we're gonna be talking about uh I think he starts out with El Choco. Um, so let's do it. Okay, so so El Choco came from uh the B plus that I it was actually the first spores I ever bought uh like 25 years ago. And I grew the things for probably a good 20 years before anything interesting came out of them, uh, which was these couple of hairy fruits that you see here. Uh, they're dark brown. They stood out from the rest. The, the, L, the, the regular B plus was so regular and boring, I honestly never even thought to take pictures of it. it, it look up Cubensis and you'll see what it looks like. That's, that's what it looked okay. like. Uh, but so here we got the first El Choco fruit. So they, they obviously they caught my eye. Uh, and this was right around the same time that uh, the TAT syndicate was just getting started. People were going nuts about albino mushrooms. Like the, there was the TAT, there was Avery's albinos hadn't been out for too long. Uh, so, so people were just excited about albino mushrooms in general. Right. And then this dark thing appeared. So, I mean, it just, the obvious thing to me was to try and make it darker. So my plan was to continue to grow it and only select from the darkest fruits in each batch so as to encourage that trait. And so, you can see the you can see the hairy texture was was a lot more visible in the earlier uh the earlier generations. The more recent ones are are a bit smoother and you don't see the hair until they spread out all the way. Uh but but here we got the the stems are still white. These are the earliest generation El Choco here. So the stems are still very white. Uh, and the later, the later generations, the stems actually started developing more pigment as well. Okay. So you get this really dark cap, you clone it, you grow it. How frequently are you going back to spore with that? Or are you always going back and forth? I actually, I didn't clone it at all. I just took spores and kept going with the spores, spore to grain, spore to, well, spore to agar to grain. Okay. And so and always so spores, but then always looking for the darkest caps off of those grows. Right. Okay. And then, then the idea of going through spore is you get some variety in the grow, but then you can select the darkest ones. So you're you're trying to refine that trait. You're trying to narrow it down and, and encourage it to be the dominant trait. And so how far along was it before you started seeing this? I mean, it literally looks like hair on these caps. It from the very beginning, like the very first ones were hairy. Uh, and they, they stayed here. Oh yeah. Okay. They were, huh? But they got shorter each time you'll see in these pictures as they go along, they get shorter and thicker each generation also. And you can see some variation there. And I hear you can see the hair really good. 
like the hair splits apart and the actual cap underneath the hair is white but normally you don't see that kind of separation like on a regular golden cap it's all right. pretty much one substance so it really it really is a strange textural thing especially here my god i mean it literally looks like this mushroom's wearing a wig this this giant one represents the transition between the old El Choco and the new El Choco, where they are thicker, they're more barrel stemmed, uh, and they have more of a droopy cap instead of just a standard flat spread out cap. That's but ever since this fruit, they, they transition to the to these things, the more like dumpling looking okay. beastly ones. But then along with that, the hair became a little bit harder to see as the caps continue to get darker and darker. It's like the the hairs are just so saturated that it looks like all one solid surface. Oh, they really are getting darker here, yeah. Which I'm not complaining though, because I wanted them darker. Yeah, you know, and and they're still they're still getting darker. And now you can see on the on the stipe there, you can see the the dark veins on the stipe too. Like there's there's just pigment all through that thing. But now it looks like to some degree, is it losing that hair quality, or is it just you don't see it till the very end? Like in you don't see it till the very end when it spreads out. Okay. Like when they're when the caps are more more condensed, they they're just it's just solid. You can't tell. It looks smooth. They're shiny. But then you can see on the bigger ones here, I don't know if I've got a close-up of these or not, but on the there, there you go. You can see it on the larger cap as it's fully spread out. So this is a great example of perspective and observation in the sense that if you marry yourself to the idea, I'm looking for a certain morphology, there's a certain look I think I'm going to get from the, this genetic, and then I get some oddball, you can toss it you can dehydrate it and move on or you can do what you did which is say let's get some spores from this guy let's see if this trait continues on and now you've isolated this thing that maybe the rest of us might have let go of well for the first like probably 12 years that i was growing i kind of had the opposite mindset my idea was i i purchased these spores from a website and i grew them and i need to keep them the same right and so when I would grow my B plus, if I got an oddball looking fruit, it was a reject. And I would try to keep that same like standard, like picture perfect, what I thought was picture perfect for the variety. But then you know, I realized, you know, years later that everybody's grow is different. And like, you know, when somebody asks in one of the groups, they say, what's, what's your favorite, what's your favorite variety? Everybody lists off a bunch of different things, but nobody's things are the same. Right. Like no two people's B plus grow the same way. There's 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 selection bias in each person's growing, whether they think about it or not, you're you're gonna be more likely to take spores from the best looking fruit, what you think is the best looking sure. fruit, the largest fruit, uh, the most productive looking clusters or whatever. But everybody's kind of following their own path on that. And so you you really don't know, like with if one person says, Well, B plus is great, and somebody else says B plus sucks, like it probably did for them. You know, it's just yeah. it's it's different for everybody. Like the, the El Choco is a good example of of just a straight line isolation looking for a single trait. And you can see that it's gone through some other some other traits as well, just kind of came along with it, the shortness and thickness and the, the different shape and whatnot. But the color was always the goal. And that was really my main my main focus was just trying to get the darkest ones. But and, weird and, follows and, weird. And it it's attractive fruit. Um I remember growing um I think it was one batch of stargazers I had one time and it just happened to be a little bit darker than the rest. And I just remember thinking, man, these are handsome. I like this dark color, but you do not see it that often. Well, and that was, really that was don't. the thing with the El Choco too, is that like, I, it, it kind of opened my eyes to looking at colors in general, like even, even in the, the regular Cambodians and, and whatever other regional varieties, you do get a lot of, a lot of different looks and right any one of those things like it doesn't matter what it is it could be a little ripple to the edge of the cap it could be a a thickness or thinness to the stem any of those things can be pursued as a trait it has to do with the observer what you're attracted to what trait you want to carry on and i i think uh i think the one thing that i notice about you is you seem to be just zany enough that you're pursuing things that some other people might uh, I don't, I don't want to take a picture of that. I That's pursue not... everything. <laughs> you pursue. I pursue the, I pursue the traits on fruits that I don't like just to see if I can get them to happen again, you know? <laughs> right. That's and and you get surprises that way because uh, when you take something uh, and, and clone it, 
you you're you're isolating that genetic and your phenotype is is and this was discussed uh julian and, and kyler talked about this too your phenotype is a combination of genetics and environmental factors right. that influence how those genetics express so when you have a a, a regular grow from from a multi-spore syringe or uh you know an initial swab plate on agar you get a bunch of different looks uh, but any one of those fruits cloned and grown on its own with just its own genetic is going to perform differently because you've right. you've changed the environment now. It's not it's not fighting for space with other genetics, and it's right. it's just free to do its own thing. And so a lot of things really do perform better from clone. Um, okay, so speaking of this, you said a few things that had me thinking about this concept of just paying attention as a grower, observing things carefully. And I think I I definitely fall into this category. Half the time I'm harvesting a, hu- a tub, I am busy. I got something else going on. I got kids and, and maybe I'm not observing things or I'm not taking the time I should with things. And you said something about, you know, I re- something like I really carefully looked through the tub for for subtle differences and you know chose my fruits very carefully to clone um you want to take a little time just to talk about the role that you think observation plays in developing as a a hobby mycologist it's definitely huge uh obviously in the beginning uh your your number one thing is can i get them to grow at all (laughs) yeah you know and that's and that's a huge that seems like a huge obstacle to get over in the in the very first part. But once you start getting them to to grow, and you you like, okay, now I'm going to grow another variety, and now I'm going to grow another variety, and and we start playing with things. Uh, if, if you look at my posts in my Facebook group, uh, I take a lot of pictures. Yeah. I take a lot of pictures. I take wide angle pictures for the whole tub, and I zoom in on every different difference that I can find in those tubs from the time they're tiny pins all the way until they're full grown. And so like, by the time I'm picking them, I've already got my heart set on who I'm going to grab for what, you know? And then when we get into the, into the flow hood, then I start picking them apart even more because now I can look underneath them better without, without breaking them. But it's, 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 it's not just visible things you can see, but performance as well. Like how fast is it growing? Does it start off skinny and then get fat? Does it start off fat and then stretch out and get skinny? Like, I mean, they do all kinds of weird things. The, uh, What's the the one I'm working right now? The Jeepers Peepers. It's a, a Keepers Creepers and a OGPE cross. Okay. It starts off like balls, like they're perfectly spherical when they're little, and then as they grow, they eventually like stretch out. But they stay spherical for like the first half of their life at least, and then they end up all kinds of different shapes when they're done. It's just mm. bizarre things. Uh, in the uh, we've got a, a Mexican red spore one here that's got a few things uh, we can talk about in there right, as far me... as that. This was sent to me by a, a mycologist in Chile, cool. and it was collected in Mexico, brought back down to Chile, and then I got a print from there. Uh, and this is what it looked like the very first time I grew it. Uh, skinny little fruits with small, very, very round caps, uh, not much visible veil at all. Like you, you really just can't find a veil on these things. It separates like when the cap is born, basically. So it yeah. never has a veil. Uh, and then it has red spores. So I was excited. I've got this red spore thing. It's a it's kind of a wild found thing. So nobody else has it really. So I was excited about that. Uh, but then it grew this thing. Uh, I grew this little, this little lumpy uh, fin thing. And of course that caught my eye because I'm like, well, that's weird. You know, it looks like it's got caps, but they didn't really open. Uh, but I cloned it. And this is what became chupacabra this was my chupacabra isolation oh, and i named it that okay. because a chupacabra is a weird mexican folk creature uh and this is mexican and weird so i figured I like it, it. it fit. but you can see it's it's kind of repeating the fin thing again with that one fruit only in this tub the fruits actually separated and grew into separate fruits uh-huh. but then if you go to the next one what they would do is they would start off very skinny with small bullet-shaped caps and then after they'd sat there for about a week being small and skinny, then they would just have these random growth spurts and like double and triple in size within a day or two. And there, you can see the cap spreading out on them now, but you can still see some of the skinny ones like in the transitory phase between the the small and the large. But so I'm thinking you, at this point, I'm thinking so these are beautiful. Like, yeah, you know, I'm just going back here thinking, so you started with this. How many grows in before you get this weird blob? This was my second grow. Second grow. 
you clone that, you get this. Then did you clone this six fingered hand again? Or? No, 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 no. This is just this is just going to turn into the fruits in the next pictures. I don't know oh, if, I if okay. that particular one is in the next pictures, but it, they, it just did kind of the same thing. And then uh, you swab them and regrow them. So this is what generation of? This is probably first first generation, maybe second generation still of the chupacabra. Oh, but wow. now this is also a purple spored mushroom. Mm -hmm. It lost the red spores. So without, without crossing with anything, it just went from being a red spored mushroom to a purple spored mushroom that looks completely different from the parent, but also really a lot different from anything else too. And it's got this wonderful two-stage gill structure where there's like an inner section and then a, like a fat ruffled outer section around mm -hmm. the curled edge. Uh, just really bizarre morphology on these things. Uh, this one, this little fruit, this is the first Choco Rojo fruit. This was a very dark little tiny fruit. Obviously, it's smaller than a dime. Uh, but this was in the same grow that that uh, Chupacabra mutant was in that was cloned. Okay. And this went on to grow these subterranean mushrooms that wow. actually grew under the subsurface, and then they would burst out once they were full size. So you cloned this or you... I did clone this one because okay, it was so... it was too dirty to, to try and swab. And got this. And I got this, these underground growing mushrooms that you can see the subsurface just is just oh, broken yeah. apart because uh, they're growing underground and coming out, uh, which right. made these also very difficult to swab. <laughs> yes, when they're substrate in the gills, it's hard to get a clean sample. Yeah, but I, I was horrified by by this grow. Uh, I was like, well, this is really horrible. But early El Choco, and I named it Choco Rojo because of the dark hairy cap. It's got that similar that similar feature. Early, cho early El Choco also had a tendency to grow under the subsurface. Like you'd go to pick them and there'd be a good inch and a half of stem under the sub that you had to pull out. And then here's some, here's some later ones once they started cooperating and growing on the surface. Uh, and and it's, it's a little bit more of a reddish brown than what the El Choco has, uh, which is nice because with the Choco Rojo name, I was just trying to give pay homage to the, to the source. But uh, it's it a self-fulfilling prophecy. They, they want to be reddish brown. So... If, so if did you the go, spores revert back to rust colored or? Uh, no, nope, these are stay. also a purple spore. These are solid purple spore all the way. Uh, so that was lost fairly early on. Yes. Once you had that mutation. Yeah, it just okay. it it has a tendency to. It's the same thing with like, uh, and these are some some the ones that I just grew in this last week or so. I picked these. Uh, they're much more cooperative. They're on the surface. And uh, they've still got the hairy texture. It's a lighter color than what mm -hmm. El Choco's doing. But uh, if, if you've seen uh, on Yoshi's Island, he did a grow along project with uh, Choco Rojo anemone. And that's what he grew the first time I sent them to him was these things that are basically all gills. Like it's just like a blob of gills growing on the surface of your See tub. That. And uh, I just, just the rate of mutation from this wild red spore is phenomenal, which leads us to, if you go to the next one here, uh, these are the, the the next one. The next one. This is uh this is Amex. This is my my albino Mexican that came from that same red spore as well. Uh, oh. I mean, it, look at it. It's totally different yeah. from the original red spore totally for sure. Different. Huge fruits. Uh, but this one was neat because this tub, uh, this and this was the very first tub from spore from a single albino fruit that grew up in one of the other tubs. Uh, it has two distinct morphologies. There's there's and I named them asymmetrical and round. Uh, the round fruits have a very rounded cap for one, but they also have regular flat, straight gills, while the asymmetrical fruits have kind of bizarre shaped caps. Yeah. And they've got like branching morel mushroom type gills, which is really not something you see too often on a cubensis uh, or at all. I'm not sure ever. But uh, let's see. I think we got some gills coming up next. Uh, these are the these are the round fruits. These are the round fruits. I separated them in the in the flow hood, and there's the gills, very straight. Yeah. Uh, and these are the asymmetrical fruits, and their oh, gills. Yeah. So now, did you get these two phenotypes just once, or is that pretty consistent now? How these spores work? This this one's pretty new. So so okay. this this what this tub gave me the two phenotypes in one tub, and now I've grown them out separately since then from spore, and they've kept their distinctly different phenos. The asymmetrical one still has the branching gills and the mm -hmm. round one has the straight gills. Uh, so 
and this this goes back to being observant. Like yeah. I'm picking apart every detail of these fruits, and I'm finding yeah. the more you look, the more weird stuff you find. Yeah, you, right? and this that's... this is a this is the new tub of the asymmetrical one. Yeah, and I think that's a great fruits. lesson. Just the the idea of that that a trait might be subtle when you first catch it, but if you then take spores or clone of that fruit, you you just really don't know until you do it if you could amplify that or, or or what that will lead to. Well, we've got this we've got this this idea that all these different varieties that we have are are separate entities but they're really just variations on the same thing. Uh, The the regional varieties around the world, you know, spores can travel on the wind literally around the world. Mm -hmm. So uh, cubensas growing in Thailand could come from Mexico, you know, it's, but, but they all kind of grow the same outdoors because the conditions favor the, the standard default, most efficient phenotype. Uh, But once you start down a path with any isolation, it just it it's a straight line thing like it doesn't go backwards it just goes forwards and it it might want to do the default thing you know especially if you grow it in harsh conditions uh contaminated conditions are known to to right. cause change in the genetics and how they express usually towards a uh, revert towards what we would say is the the default uh the most efficient spore producer okay. which is the you know your regular regular outside mushroom and it's a survival tactic but it's not always that way. Like I've had some contaminated grows produce mutations that were better. Uh, so it's just a, you know, it's I, whenever I have a contaminated jar, it depends on how bad it looks. If it look, if it's got yellow juice in the bottom of it, right. eh, you know, not, not doing it. But if it's, if it's got a couple of grains poking against the glass, I'll take a chance on it, you know, cause it, it, it might do what I want. It might not, but it might do something interesting. I got a question on that. So, I do that from time to time where if it it doesn't smell earthy enough, but it doesn't also smell sweet or rancid to me. And I'm like, there might be something in here, but the mic looks pretty OK and I'll run it. But I will run it one to one just thinking that if I you, you know, if it doesn't have to colonize quite as hard, uh, maybe it'll have a chance. Uh, do you do anything different if you have a, jar, a questionable jar like that? No, well, but the thing is, I run all my tubs at close to a one to one ratio because they're there. they're uh, well, they're it's it's a system that's set up for speed. Uh, the closer your sub to your spawn ratio is, the faster it's going to colonize, the faster it's going to fruit, and the faster I can get something else in that tub, so I can keep working through generations of a project. Uh, right. So there's there's some trade off with with yield there in the long run, but I'm usually dumping them out after the first flush anyway because right. I'm again trying to get something else in there. Uh, but, but faster fruiting is better for that. Like the, the longer it sits in a, in a substrate, you know, the, the more it can fester. So you do want to get it to, to fruit quickly, but the smell is a big thing too. Uh, you can open it up and it might smell a little off, but when it punches you right in the nose, you, uh, you know, something's yeah. real bad. You know, we've got the, we've got the blind grower in our groups, right? uh, and, and he's legitimately blind mm-hmm. and he, he, asks for a lot of help looking at his tubs and stuff but he he posted the other day that he opened up a jar that he thought was good but the smell hit him and he says he can't get that smell out of his nose uh, now like i can only imagine like that's a, a terrible surprise yeah he, which and one had of no, us, no foreshadowing for that one he just had to find out the hard way yeah. no yeah like yeah. one of us probably could have spotted it beforehand you know if we yeah. were looking at it through the side of the glass but that's not an option for him so yeah so you were growing mushrooms when there were a handful of varieties and now we're, you know, every day it's like there's there's something new. Um, how for you has that, have you felt that change? Has it made you even more excited um, or do you miss the good old days? You know, it's kind of, it's kind of, kind of, I've kind of been riding hand in hand with it uh, mm-hmm. because like I said earlier in my, in my early growing days, I had, you know, just a few varieties and I tried my best to make sure they stayed growing the same way every time. Uh, it it was, it was when I, I bought, uh, KSSS off of the mushrooms.com. Uh, I wanted to play with something new and they had pictures of it posted that looked like normal, regular cubensis mushrooms. Uh, but when I grew it, I got those super squatty pumpkin ones. And that, that was like my turning point where I was like, well, maybe there's something to this, you know, like Mm -hmm. uh, where, where the genetics are like more than just. Because I thought all the mushrooms were pretty much the same, except for penis envy, which I lost early on because I didn't know anything about 
swabbing at the time and right. and cloning was beyond me at that point in time too i, I started doing that later uh, but it wasn't until i got on facebook just about maybe four or five years ago that i learned that there was terminology for it like for me i just called it a tissue transfer i didn't i didn't think of it as cloning i didn't think of it as you know mono and dicaryons i was just i was just going through the motions uh but i was doing it and it worked like i just didn't know why it worked or what was good about it i just it was just part of what i did but uh there were a lot of varieties back in the day too like but a lot of them would come and go like they weren't uh you you'd have your regional varieties you know cambodian you've got your sure. your thai and your amazonian and, and then and then people run out you know they're like well i've got i've got everything so i'm not buying anything else so then people are like well how about uh illusion weavers or or flying saucers or you know they're just coming up with names for stuff purple mystics and, and lizard king and so there's always been people throwing odd things out there with names but a lot of them didn't really stick around because there wasn't anything special enough about them to justify right you know them standing out from the crowd uh but there, there seems to have been a huge proliferation and i don't know if if uh because I was a hermit, you know, I wasn't talking to anybody. I was just doing my own thing for my own amusement in the dark, you know, hidden uh, until I got on Facebook a few years back. And uh, there, there's been a, a major proliferation in stuff. Uh, and I, I, maybe social media and people's ability to communicate techniques and, and how to do things and, and stuff like that has, has led to that. I know I've taught a lot of people like just basic growing techniques and isolation and, and, and breeding work. Uh, right. and so like the more people learn it, the more people do it, the more people see it, the more people want to learn it and do it. And, and now there is a lot more stuff, but there's a lot more different stuff. Like instead of it just being a Cambodian mushroom renamed to keepers creepers, uh, it's, it's legitimately different, you know, they're there. And, and even keepers creepers, it's supposed to be a thicker, slower growing Cambodian. Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. I've seen some good ones and I've seen some very generic looking ones, but you can do that with any mushroom. But, but over the years, even the, even the regional ones have evolved, you know, from where they first came from. Like after sure. been growing, yeah. you know, whoever's growing them for, for making prints for the websites is still doing that same selection bias thing that we were talking about, where right. they're trying to keep it going as, as best they can and most productive and whatnot. So, uh, but, but yeah, there has been a huge explosion in, in new varieties and like the the ghetto cross uh is is part of that too because mm -hmm. previously it was it was the first thing people would say when something is crossed snake venom did you snake venom it did you electrocute it i'm like no i didn't do any of that stuff uh that's that's not necessary uh serial dilution is the the bona fide scientific way to correctly mate two things and ensure that it's done uh in a in a provable way uh sure. but the, the ghetto cross is really no different from putting the swab on one mushroom and sending it to agar you're just putting it in two mushrooms they're they're the same thing it's like putting two dogs in a room they might have sex they might bite each other you don't know but but they can they might they yeah. might do both yeah yeah they might do both so so when you're doing this this ghetto cross you're really just putting cubensis spores to agar. I mean, it, it doesn't matter what variety they came from. Out in nature, the wind is blowing and spores from all kinds of different mushrooms land in the same place, you know? Right. So, so it's, it's, it's not that it's, it is, it is harder to, to demonstrate, I guess. There's a, a heavier burden of proof because if you're, if you're working with like, the, you see people in the, in the, the big mushroom groups will say, I mixed my golden teacher jar with my B plus jar in the same tub. Am I going to get golden plus, you know, and uh, you know, you might, but you won't be able to tell because they both look the same anyway. But, uh, but the more, the more differences between the parent varieties that you have, uh, the, the clearer it is with the, with the combination of whether you can identify the, the traits of whether it's a cross or just a mutation of one of the parents. And being familiar with the parent varieties helps too. Like if you're if you're growing something for the first time, and uh, and then you cross it, and you've only grown it once, well, you don't know what all it could do, right? You know, so so it's, it's good to be familiar with with both parents and and know their their general propensities and uh, and proclivities and whatnot. But uh, and we can look at look at the the uh, Jack Frost is a good one. 
that's a that's a good one to look at. Uh, here's here's the wombat task. That's one side of the cross, and then uh, and then the next one is is the ape that I was working with at the time, which is your standard Sporeworks ape. But it was a very nice one. I was very happy with it, and I I ended up losing it. I've still got some swabs, and I keep trying to get it back, but it just doesn't want to live. Uh, it's sad, but it lives on in Jack Frost. So so here's these are from I, I think these might be the first or second generation uh, fruits, but you had the the ape was burly and 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 it had the bluing tendency, and then the tat was much more productive, and what the Jack Frost did was it kind of melded those things together. So you've got like it's more productive than the ape. Like you'd get a more solid pin set. Mm -hmm. Like this that that cluster of ape looks great, but it, it's in the middle of a tub with a lot of empty space. Right. You know, photography is a, a an art. Uh, <laughs> so I, I did my best to make those apes look big in the picture. Uh, the tat grows straight up and down. You know, it grows a straight stem fruit, like basically like a regular cube, a regular cube with a nice wavy cap, but very straight up and down. And the Jack Frost all curled. They all had this tendency to curl and turn upside down and put themselves gills up in the tub. Which and is that, great for uh, great for a photo. It really is. And the, the, the blue color on the gills is the, the tat will turn slightly blue. Like it's still white, but it's like a very pale kind of grayish blue when it mm -hmm. matures. It doesn't do this distinct, sharp, drastic contrast of color. And, and definitely, definitely more productive than the typical ape. Yeah. As far as, <laughs> as, far as performance goes. Now you now mentioned this you mentioned face. this too, yeah. This uh, unique fruit. Yeah, the smiley face. He's like the the nightmare before Christmas or whatever guy. Uh, Tim Burton. Yeah, I was. Uh, I was. I, it caught my eye, uh, and usually I wouldn't see the tops of the caps because they do curl over so often. But I, I saw this one because it was stuck on another stem, so it couldn't bend over all the way. And I was like, well, that's kind of neat. These blue spots on there. So I ended up cloning that fruit, and that led to the the blue ring isolation of Jack Frost. And you can see on these caps here, the ring itself is actually translucent. It's the same white as the rest of the cap, but it's see-through, light passes through it. And so when the gills turn blue, then the color that shows through that translucent part, part turns blue as well. That is so cool. So is this really, so I'm not gonna lie, if I saw this, I would have assumed that was an environmental uh, caused uh, mutation. I would have never even, I, I, I would have lost it. I'll take so, a chance on it. It yeah. might be, it might not, you know, it, and that's, that's one of the cool things about cloning too, is that it's a, it's kind of a check step in your grow to see if something is genetic or environmental. True. Yeah. And in this case, it, it did repeat. And then here they are after the gills turn blue and you can see how, how stark that, that blue ring oh, yeah. is looking through the top of the cap. Which, and that's just, you know, it's eye catching. It doesn't make the fruit any better to eat, mm -hmm. I don't think. You know, that it just looks cool. cool. Yeah. That's <laughs> that's all it takes, man. That's what we want. It's like Pokemon. We just want. But, you know, there new. seems to be a correlation between potency and a couple different things. Like, potency likes to follow growth speed primarily. That's like the number one. Mm -hmm. The slower growing it is, the more time it has to build alkaloids, is the theory. Mm -hmm. Uh, we really don't know for sure how it all works. Uh, maybe once it's legalized, we'll be able to do some real legitimate, you know, university studies on stuff like that. Yeah. But uh, but there's a correlation with weirdness, too. Like things that just get weird, like, like they get stronger for whatever reason. Uh, density is another factor. Uh, and I don't know if it's just because the 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 cell structure inhibits oxidization or, or what the deal is. I, I know uh, you guys were talking the other night about... Uh, the the chitin being yep. uh beaten firmer in some like if you take a melmac melmacs are known to not bruise heavily uh because they're like wood yeah very well i mean basically but your jack frosts uh when they ripen like if you let them turn all the way blue they soak up a lot of water and they get soft it's like picking a tub of whipped cream and they turn like navy blue as soon as you touch them because you're crushing their cells like they're just they're so wet that they're they're fragile i know yeah it's true. That's interesting. Uh, for sure. I mean, I, I don't think it, it's not disputable. 
the slower it grows, I'm always getting excited. As long as it keeps growing, I'm happy. <laughs> Keep slow growing better. as slow as you want. And I remember when I was first starting out, I was like, ah, it's not taking forever. What's wrong? Because, of course, I grew boring stuff in the beginning that just grew fast and I was done with it. And then I started, you know, playing with some some more interesting varieties. And, well, and you'll see some you'll see some beginner posts like that too, where they're like, "Yeah, this only took three days," and you're like, "Well, all right, I don't know that. yeah, it can't possibly be that good." Yeah, I just had some Woutla do that, where I'm like, "Okay, this this grew like weeds. Uh, it's really not bruising hardly at all." And yeah, it uh, it was fine, but it it wasn't. The faster growing it is, the more yeah. it's focused on getting spores out into the environment. Like right. that's its primary task, you know. And and mm-hmm. and I guess like once you've really separated something off into its own little isolation, then maybe it it's you know we like to think things are sentient. Maybe it 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 likes the care that you're taking in it. It's re- it's rewarding you because you're yeah. a good pet owner and you're yeah. you're giving it food to eat and, and an environment to live in safely free of uh, beetles and slugs right and- yeah it just it gets fat and lazy spores what do i need spores for this guy's just doing everything for me well i tell you what though yeah. I, I i've been growing all these different weird tat things and 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 tbc and ghost and melmac and all these things and and you know the slower ones are always stronger but when i got the the ogpe was the first, one of the first varieties I ever got. And then I lost it pretty much after like three grows. I, I screwed it up, contaminated it and lost it yeah. uh, because it wouldn't print. That was my problem. It wouldn't drop a print. And I was like, what the fuck is wrong with this thing? You know, it just, it won't print. So it, it died. Uh, but I just got it back uh, less than a year ago. I, I went ahead and ordered it again from mushrooms.com, uh, grew it and it it grew just like I remembered it. They've, they've managed to keep that culture like- wow. I don't know if they've got it on like a, a 20 year slant or what, but it's it's still going exactly how I remember it. It is slower than anything. Like it's really? still, I mean, this is the original PE and it is still by far the slowest thing I've ever grown next to like an Enigma type thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, or, okay, there's, there's chocolate crinkle, which is a different, whole different ballpark because it doesn't stop growing after it produces spores. So that's like a totally different right. issue. Uh, which we've got that too, if I can bring that up on the shared screen thing. Yeah, let's find it. There's some there's some stuff there. Uh, I want to... It's not this one, is it? That's the one. Oh, that's the okay, one. Cool. Okay, so this is this is, uh, this is is the original Mr. Crinkle Fruit. And uh, you can, this... Okay, you're, you're, I just want to make sure you can scroll through these. Yes, it looks like you can. I think I can. Uh, right. This is this is the first fruit that started Mr. Crinkle. Uh, it was a... Uh, like a hard lump of it was like like white clay it grew in a grow of the tat source genetics it's an unstable gt that produced the whole tat line basically okay uh, but this this came in one of those grows it it grew this little thing uh it never got any bigger it was hard as a rock it didn't have any gills uh oh there's there's the el choco that i crossed it with uh but so this is this is the original mr crinkle now i did eventually clone that and it produced fruits with gills uh, and then I now what, what part of it did you did you clone the blob portion? Yes, I'm assuming. With this one, okay. This one I broke the cap off looking for gills, and there wasn't any, so I just took a chunk okay. from the from the inside of the cap. Okay. Uh, and it, it grew some decent fruits. It grew some some big hard wooden kind of golden teacherish fruits, uh, but very slow and very hard with wrinkly gills. Uh, and that's what became Mr. Crinkle. Then you've got the El Choco, which it crossed with. And this was the first grow. Um, yeah. 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 Not really a success story at first glance, maybe. Sure. Yeah. Uh, this know, actually looks like my living room on a Saturday morning. <laughs> so, yeah. there's, but there's like, you can see there's like some big enigma type brain thing. Yeah. Uh, there's, there's a little fat golden teachery looking squat fruit. There's a, a skinny thing over there along the side. Uh, there's one over on the right hand side there that that was the first like that's what I started working with for the chocolate crinkle line was the actual right. fruit there, uh, and it and then there's this hedgehog looking thing coming out the side of one of the Enigma things. Uh, okay. I did clone that, and the the results from that came back uh, pretty much like the regular chocolate crinkle fruits. Okay. There were these little worm things, little curly Q things that uh, 
they didn't ever branch like Enigma does. They just kept growing curly. Mm -hmm. uh, so now to go back, the first time you crossed, that was just by doing a ghetto swab of the two fruits. Yes. Okay. And and you can see there's some variety there. So there was uh, yeah. But I found out later that chocolate crinkle will do the same kind of variety stuff from clone even. Like it's just it's got randomness built into its genes. Uh, yeah, there really are some varieties that want to be exactly the same all the time, and then there are other ones that want to surprise you all the time. I, I have seen that. This this little piece right here is a, a good example of what what eventually turned into the chocolate crinkle braids culture, which is my okay. attempt at capturing the Enigma style of it. It does produce pigmented enigma type stuff sometimes cool. uh but sometimes it also grows completely white uh a couple more little crinkly fruits mm -hmm. and, and you know performance has never been a big thing with this one like it doesn't like to give you a full flush it likes to give you a few weird fruits but these things are hard like wood i mean they they take like a good three weeks to grow and uh, and you can see the you can see the choco on these. You can see the hairy texture on the oh, yeah. cap, uh, but the fruit morphology is definitely not very choco-y. And, and then the, here's the, the gills are like the crinkle more. But that's that's where the crinkle comes yeah. in. And I am a sucker for crinkly gills. Like I, cool. even if they just get a little bit wavy, it, it excites me. Mm -hmm. But but these are pretty downright crinkly. And I'm and, sure fun to swab. You've got it, it does some mixes, like we've got a mix of golden ones and chocolate top ones. Uh it does weird Dr. Seuss trees. Yeah, man. Uh, it does cool. Uh that slab of bacon or whatever that is over there. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's only just gotten weirder. And and I couldn't even tell you at this point which of these grows were from spore and which ones for clone, because they, they all are just weird. They're that consistently weird, huh? Uh, this one was like, I think, like 260-something grams. Uh, wow. Just a monstrosity. Kind of looks like a, a pool slide. Oh, here now. This was uh, this was where I found out that they don't stop growing after they produce spores. Uh, so this fruit was already about a month old at this point, this big mm -hmm. one. And uh, and you can see the gills are like fully dark with spores. Like it's, it's not dropping them anywhere, but they're on there. Uh, but for whatever reason, I got caught up doing other stuff and I didn't pick it on time. And then this happened. Wait, where'd it go? Come back. So you can see there's mycelium growing out of the gills there, but then there's also these weird little tentacle growths. And what's happening is the gills themselves are actually just fattening up and turning into like their own little fruit bodies. Mm. Uh, it's the weirdest thing. Like I... So I it's really know. growing. It's not. It's not like... That phase where once it's produced spores and opened up, it wants and it gets reclaimed of... by that right. Some of sometimes your fruit will get soft and then the mycelium will grow on it. Yeah, uh, this one's still hard as a rock. Wow. Like it's 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 still alive and it's just the. I've had them grow entire new fruits off of old fruits. Here's a mm -hmm. close up of those little tentacle things. Yeah, I mean those are cool. Uh, just really bizarre behavior uh oh and then it produced albinos uh because everything that i grow produces albinos at some i was gonna point. say i think that that is a given for you right you're gonna this, get this is there's a cool little little uh like five slide uh story for this mushroom so so this guy was growing in the corner uh and at this point he's already mature his gills have started to turn gray uh so there's there's spores there's live mature spores on there and then he spreads out a little bit further so now you can see the gills better and they're all yeah. crinkly and you're like "Ooh, he's he's ready to go he's showing me his gills he wants to get swabbed and then the gills start to get longer and fatter and fatter and right and they're they're like fatter, thick yeah. leathery meat flaps at this point like they're not gills anymore they still have some spores on them just from when they had spores from before mm -hmm. but a lot of the spores under the microscope you'll see that a lot of the spores are actually germinating and just turning into more mycelium and oh, getting man. reabsorbed into the mass uh so you know when the spores germinate they start off as as monokaryotic but if they encounter a dicaryon then they borrow mm -hmm. a nuclei from that 
Uh, and so when they grow on the mushroom itself, it's like instant. They're just like, they just get reincorporated and become, they kind of knit together and make more flesh. It's crazy. And it just gets bigger. And this was the final form when I picked it. Wow. I went from just being a little round fruit in the corner to being like that entire side of the tub, basically. That is amazing. And you cloned this. Please tell me you cloned this, right? Yeah, but it just came back doing more oh, okay. stuff. So, so the albino chocolate crinkle is probably even weirder than the regular chocolate crinkle. Uh, it's, it's, it just doesn't follow any rules. Like, like this particular fruit here, it opens up and has gill surfaces coming out of it in different directions on different sides. Uh, but there's no discernible cap or stem right. anywhere. Like yeah, it's just it's just a hot mess. And uh, yeah, that's I cool. Don't know exactly what's going on with that, but it's another similar kind of thing. Uh, this this little bottom part here was like a little porthole at one point in time, uh, but it opened up and ended up having gills. Uh -huh. uh, this one has like what I thought was going to be a cap, but then it turned into gills on the top side of the cap thing. Wow. Uh, and then and this is uh, a bubble gum. If you can see, there's a couple little cat parts on this as well. With the, with now, the how is the potency on this albino crinkle? It's ridiculous. Okay. Like I, I was thinking like, it probably was. Like this, this fruit here in this picture was probably a good five five weeks old, maybe, mm -hmm. and still growing. Uh, because again, you've got you've got like that that time of growth. Uh, somebody somebody said i don't remember who it was but somebody was talking about this once and uh, and they were talking about how uh the mycelium branches like mm -hmm. that's that's in its nature it, it grows it branches and and then when it goes into fruiting it just kind of continues that branching instead of okay. instead of focusing on the you know producing the basidiocarp it just it's got its instruction screwed up and right. it, the material of it is not really cap or stem it's just yeah. kind of stuff hmm. you know and it's it's i don't even know what to call it it's just it's mushroom material and it's potent right but that again makes, it, that you makes know, more sense i like it, it just kind of keeps growing until it runs out of food it doesn't ever produce spores so it's it's just kind of confused confused is a good word for it though Hey, it didn't get confused about the potency though. So no, no, and, and that's that's the chocolate crinkle is definitely up there as probably the strongest thing I've ever eaten. Like it's just just ridiculous. Uh, the the sample uh, Jordan Jacobs did a, a HPLC testing on uh, on the brains, mm -hmm. and it came out to like I think like two point oh six or something like that percent, uh, where your baseline cube is around like point six or seven, I think. Right. So it's it's a pretty it's a pretty good step up. Yeah. That's amazing. All right, so I got a question for you. Uh where am I at here? Okay, so let's we've been talking about doing a lot of grows and we sort of talked about uh varieties and all that. Um one thing that I think you touched on a little bit um in, in the gene pool interview that I think a lot of new people or even anybody, honestly, anybody would benefit from, you said something about, there's a lot of very subtle little differences that you do. So for example, you could watch a still air box video, like here's how to work in a still air box. And there are the things they say, and then there are subtle little things that if they're good, they're doing, but they might not be talking about that really yes. is the secret to improving your sterile technique. So I thought it might be worth talking about some of those subtle things. I, I work uh, in healthcare. I do sterile procedures at work all the time. And the training I received doing that definitely plays into my mycology work at home, just giving me sort of a sterile mindset, so to speak. Well, and I come from a background in in uh, food service management. So, so same so thing. Kind of you have that mindset. Thing. Except you're working with like contagious diseases, and we're just working with trying not to get the mayonnaise and the mustard. Sure. But I once you give people the contagious disease, then I right. try to get it back out of them. Yes, that's true. Um, but uh, but I really think it is a mindset because certain 
certain people in the beginning really struggle with it. And I, I think part of it is that they're not thinking the right way about sterility or they're not thinking the right way about how things are transmitted. So I just thought it might be worth bringing up with you. So some well, of the things of it, that you part do. Part of it, I think people are victims of marketing uh, because you have things like Lysol that says kills 99.9% of, of germs. Yeah. But if you read the fine print, it's if they sit in a puddle of it for 10 minutes, you know, <laughs> right, right. Uh, so... So just puffing it up in the air does really pretty much nothing, but it's a, it's an air freshener. It makes your house smell right. Lysol-y. Uh, same with, with, uh, with rubbing alcohol. It, it does sanitize. It does kill things. Uh, it can, it can lice the, you know, the cell walls on, mm -hmm. on microorganisms or whatever, but, but there's an exposure time required for that. Uh, with one of the reasons why we recommend 70% ISO versus 91% is the 70% doesn't evaporate as fast and it gives it more time to, yeah. to do its job. Uh, but people get so caught up in, I've got my Lysol, I've got my bleach, I've got my peroxide, I've got my, you know, all my different chemicals and they don't, they don't solve the problem. And then they come back in a post like a week later, like I did all these. Chemicals. I bought everything. Why, yeah, doesn't like, why, yeah. why doesn't it work? Right. Uh, and it is, it really is, it comes down to physics. It, it comes down to not putting the germs in the work, uh, which when, when you recommend PF tech to people, they're like, oh, well, I heard it doesn't yield good. I'm like, uh, yields better than failure. Right. I bet you. Right. Exactly. And, and, it, and it's a good intro. It, it is a good intro to, to, to the process. And, and it gives you time while you're letting those cakes marinate and whatnot to, to do more research and reading right. and practice and, and cut yourself a sab and all that stuff. And, and uh, it really is, it, it's practice makes perfect though. Like yeah, everything comes with repetition. You're not going to get it right the first time. Uh, you also see a lot of people in the groups, you'll see people, well, I, I, I grew 15 tubs of mushrooms and I didn't have a single contamination, like 0%. Right. And then the next week they're on and saying, all my tubs are green. And, and right. I went from, zero percent to a hundred percent like well because you didn't learn you know you got lucky <laughs> so. oh that was me in the beginning i think you even mentioned this too um in the uh, m so here's my theory in the beginning wherever you're working you haven't brought a bunch of microbes and and fungi spores into that area and so in the beginning, maybe you're eager, you're uh, going to follow the rules the right way, and then you start getting into some grows, and you're having success and success, and then you get sloppy. I, I can tell you, as soon as I got that flow hood, <laughs> man, I got so sloppy. I just said, well, I'm working right next to the, the grill, man. I'm right by it. Nothing can get in here. I wouldn't wash my hands, and then I started noticing, oh, I get these little yeast and uh, staff colonies grown right on the edge of my plates. Oh, I'm touching it because I didn't wash my damn hands. When, when I'm doing when I'm doing work with plates in the hood, I have like there's like a like an MMA commentator. It's Joe Rogan mm -hmm. in the back of my head, and he's doing a play by play on everything I do. Okay. And every single mistake you make increases the odds of yes. contamination. So as I'm working. Oh, I bumped into that jar. Well, bumping into that jar can launch things from your skin that wouldn't yep. otherwise come off. Uh, I'm trying to put the the transfer on the plate, and it won't come off the blade. Every little fumble increases yep. the chance of something else getting in there. So, like, a, as I'm as I'm bumping into shit, I'm like, God, God there's another fuck up, and I'll, uh, this yeah. plate's a fifty fifty gonna make it, you know? And yeah. I'll still try it, but you know, and sure enough, usually. The ones I get that come up contaminated, I'm like, yep, I knew it. Like, oh, I mark them. Yeah. And it's <laughs> always those ones. Yeah, for sure. That one's got the, the low percentage of success going for it. Yeah. But, but it is practice makes perfect. The more you do it, uh, you, you refine your technique through repetition, uh, hopefully, and you learn from your mistakes. And, and like, I, I used to religiously, you know, soak my hands with Lysol and not Lysol, but ISO and, and, and do all that glove stuff and all that stuff too. But it didn't seem to make a difference, you know, cause you can use the, the ISO and the gloves and still get contamination yeah. or you can not use them and not get contamination. So it, it's all in the process. It's all in, in how you do everything. And, yeah. and it is, it is good to wash your hands, you know, for sure. Like that. <laughs> I, do I, that. that. I uh, finally could, went back to wash. No, I mean, I'm telling you, I would come home from work. And I would go straight down going, I got 20 minutes to do some transfers, try to get the work done. And then I'd be halfway in going, 
God damn, I didn't wash my hands. I didn't wipe down my sterilizer. I didn't wipe down anything. I just went to work with this basic mindset of if I don't touch anything in here, I'm okay. And I mean, most of the time it does work, but it doesn't work all the time. It's just, it's your, it's that, that percentage you're playing the percentages and the more, the more risks you take, then I like, yeah. like that, the, the open air kitchen counter inoculations, like that is a great way to do PF tech because you're working with sterile things that are enclosed in containers and you're not exposing anything. Uh, but once you start doing those, those agar plates, it's, it's a whole different ballpark. They will grow everything. And, and I've heard people complain about that too. Like, why does it grow so many things? Like, well, that's what you want it to do. Like you want it to show you the contam. Like it's good for it to show you the contam. It's it. You can, Oh, the, the, the antibiotics thing drives me nuts. Like there, there probably are some applications where that comes in handy, but it's usually beginners asking, where do I get gentamicin for my plates? It's like, right. cause I, it, it, that's not going to fix your problem. It's like, even if you have gentamicin in your plates and bacteria falls in there and can't grow, it's still in there when you send the plate to the grain and it'll grow in there. Yeah. There's no antibiotics in the grain. Yeah. So I, I don't know if you saw it. I posted it in the group. Uh, it's a, it was a study done with, uh, with E. coli uh, in a giant rectangular agar plate with different levels of antibiotics all the way through. Oh, yeah, I think I saw this. And so like it was like 10% antibiotics at the beginning, and then it goes all the way up to like a 1,000 times the amount needed to prevent mm -hmm. E. coli in the middle. Mm -hmm. And it took it 11 days to take the whole thing over, like, right. which is about how long I keep an agar plate. Right. Uh, so if it can do that giant thing in 11 days, it can definitely do my plate. Yeah. And, and that actually, we're always talking about, well, we're going to sterilize our grains and we're sterilizing this and I'm sterilizing that. But you might not be. You just, you, you just don't know. And all there's, it takes is one microbe. <laughs> there's a spectrum of sterilization too. Yes. Like, you, yes. it, like what, what we run uh, typically, uh, three cycles the, the sterilization cycle is supposed to be 30 minutes but we do three cycles on grains because of the endospores it's got to penetrate like all the way to the core of those grains uh and usually we do four uh 120 minutes is is like the the community standard pretty much for grains uh the if you go by that that pc chart or whatever with the pressure and time it says 90 minutes but 90 minutes didn't always do it for me. I had maybe 25% contam rate on, on 90 minutes and, and much closer to 100% on 120 minutes. Yeah. But, but things sterilize partially, and it, it might be right. sterilized enough for your mycelium to get through it if you shake the jar, you know, in the, At right, the right times. Yeah. Right. But yeah. if you let your jar try to colonize from start to finish, it'll almost always stall out before it gets to the very bottom. It'll struggle and there'll be the bottom yeah. grains will be wet and it just won't quite be right. Yeah. Like it, that's why we shake the jars. Agreed. So, okay. Speaking of grain. Um, My I, grain I, is the best I, and everybody I, else's grain sucks. Thank you. You just, <laughs> you led me in wonderfully. Um, so, Wow, grain gangs, they are real. And watch out. I have been uh, affiliated with many a grain gang, um, some hardcore millet gangs, which I still love me some millet. millet millet's a tough one. Like, that's like probably like they're like the hell's angels of grain yes. gangs. Yes, uh, don't the tell them they're crowd. wrong. But uh, my new grain, hap my new favorite grain happens to be, I believe, your favorite grain, which is popcorn. The popcorn is cool uh, for a couple of reasons. Like every every grain has its advantages. Uh, rye is probably the 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 standard, like the traditional myco standard for for grain spawn yeah. uh, since the seventies at least, uh, and maybe before that even for commercial growing. I don't know, uh, but but rye stinks to me. Like it smells like yeah. old people sandwiches, and it. You know, we used to sell a Reuben at the restaurant I worked at, and it stunk every time you toasted the bread. And it just, I just can't get that smell out of my nose. I'm not into rye. So, so I always went with wheat. I like the, the hard red winter mm -hmm. wheat. Uh, and I like how it, how it cooks up. It kind of like, it's like this little kind of like, uh, like a star sapphire kind of look to it when the, when the grains are plumped up just right. Okay. Uh, so it's, it's kind of like a nice little indicator to let you know that it's hydrated. Uh, but popcorn is, popcorn is, uh, it's a cool grain because it's it's easily accessible. 
Uh, right. You don't have to go buy a feed store and get a 50 pound bag to get it. You can just get a couple of bags. If you're a small personal grower and you're at the grocery store, you can get a two pound bag of popcorn and you can fill up like four or five jars with it. Yeah. And, and that's plenty, you know, it's, it's convenient to grab. Uh, the cashier doesn't look at you weird. Like, why are you buying all this popcorn? Like they, nobody cares about pop. Okay. They did that to me a couple of times actually, cause I had a lot, but, right. but I just told them, yeah, we have movie night, you know, we love popcorn. So uh, but but we were talking about this earlier too. Is that the the popcorn? Uh, some people complain that it contaminates too easily, and it doesn't contaminate any easier than anything else. It just shows it to you better. Yeah. Like popcorn gets distinctly nasty looking. It just looks hideous if it gets anything else in it. Uh, rye can be kind of iffy. Oats can be iffy. Like they 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 always look kind of weird. Uh, right. So when it's it's kind of hard to tell when they're when they're bacterial, it doesn't show up quite as easily as a popcorn just gets gross. Like the the kernels go from being hard to to mushy and wet. Uh, they discolor significantly. Uh, it's just it's very it's very telling. You are, I mean, that is absolutely true. The same way that you you're saying you liked red wheat because you could tell when the moisture content was right by how it plumped up. It's really true when you have that nice yellow corn with the nice white mycelium growing on it you just it just looks right and the minute it doesn't look right you it's easy to it is much easier to tell for sure well, with with anybody's like grain that's been using a grain for a significant amount of time though they're gonna have a favoritism for it because it's what they're familiar with so that's going to be what they're good at spotting problems on you know yes, so uh, is the popcorn's just a hard sell i'm not sure why uh, it just, it's got a, a, people are like popcorn. That sucks. Uh, uh, okay. It's probably not quite as hated on as brown rice, but I grew on brown rice for years. Uh, probably the first like 10, 12 years that I was growing. That's now, was, all it, I was it whole or was it uncle Ben's? No, just whole, whole rice. You had to whole, cook yourself. Okay. Uh, this was, I mean, this was before they had those microwavable bags. Okay. Those didn't exist right. back then. If you wanted rice, you had to cook it. Uh, <laughs> And that's the problem with the Uncle Ben's tech tech mm -hmm. uh, is that you're going spore to grain. Uh, no matter how sterile the rice is, syringes are iffy and squeezing a whole thing into a, a two cup bag of rice is a, it's a you're asking for it. You know, <laughs> it's just iffy. But, but the brown rice itself, it it's a very functional grain for growing. It It just performs differently. You can't do the same things with it. Like if you have a quart jar full of it, it's hard to shake because it's sticky. It's starchy. Oh, yeah. It doesn't have like a like a shell on the outside like popcorn does. Right. Uh, so once it once it cooks and cools off, it's all stuck together like a brick. So what? But I used small jars for it. I used small half pint jars, uh, and I would just make a bunch of those. And uh, mm -hmm. and I grew them like like PF Tech cakes. I used to. Right. I first started off growing them like PF Tech cakes, but they were whole rice cakes, uh, just sitting on a bed of perlite. Uh, later, I started. You know, I figured out the bulk thing with the with the quar and, and started doing it that way would breaking it up but it is a functional grain it's uh it's probably easier to access than popcorn even like sometimes when they're out of popcorn there's still brown rice on the shelf because nobody eats that stuff it's weird it tastes like wood chips uh i kind of like it but i, I like wood chips mm -hmm. it's, it's high fiber. yeah so uh, what i noticed with with the corn compared so i i basically do oats millet 50 50 oats and millet and popcorn pretty because i just i love cycling through and learning and observing and all that yeah. kind of stuff but what i notice with popcorn i swear to god because of their shape they're pretty close to spherical and the way they sit in the jar there is plenty of space between them and it seems like the mycelium enjoy getting to jump those kernels, it just seems like it triggers the mycelium to get more rhizomorphic and kind of aggressive, is what I- The millet people would tell you that because the popcorn grains are too big, they have less surface area than the right. millet does, so you have fewer inoculation points. Man, uh, every time my popcorn <laughs> is colonized before my millet is, every single time. Well, that it's might be true in the, that might be true in the tub. Um, I have yeah. I will say my millet tends to produce denser grows, 
Right. Well, and it'll operate. probably colonize a little bit faster because yeah. it's more inoculated or interspersed into the into the substrate. But man, uh, if I just want a colonized jar, there is nothing for me faster than popcorn. No, it, uh, and it. I also feel that the roundness of the kernels helps it to break up and shake easier than some oh, other yeah. grains. Yeah. Uh, wheat was never easy for me to break up and shake. Like it just it didn't seem to want to. You could, but you'd you'd break jars doing it sometimes, like mm. getting it apart. or your rest, yeah. uh, right? Yeah. Or or I, for the longest time, I was like I was the beat it on the palm of my hand kind of guy. Yeah. And uh, boy, try and doing that with an oyster jar, oh. like oyster mycelium is like cement. Like it's it, not going anywhere. it's not. It's not good. It's, it's <laughs> really not cool. good for you. And, and you know the other thing. I was talking to a buddy who loves to talk about grain and he said, you know, everybody always says, everybody thinks that they're the smart guy when they go, Oh, just go to your local feed store. And he was telling me, he goes, man, if you go to the room, they are storing a lot of their grain in, they're storing a lot of stuff in that room. And oh yeah. Bags get moved around. And he said, he has found that, a lot of feed stores are poorly storing their grains and uh, he found that there was a lot more contamination. He said the great thing about popcorn is it's graded for human consumption. Right. It's likely to be much cleaner than any other grain you buy from a feed store. Uh, and and I, I think that's probably it is. Sense. It is. But at the same time, like when you sterilize it, it's the after sterilization part that you have to keep it clean for. So. Yeah. Uh, but but starting off with bad grains to begin with is probably not a good a good look. Uh, feed oats are are probably the dirtiest, mm -hmm. which I mean, because who cares what the cows are going to eat? You know, we just they'll just eat whatever. You know, mm -hmm. and then but, we uh, eat them. So we but popcorn is popcorn is very clean. Yeah. All right. Let's start with it. I, I've been telling, yeah, when I talk to newbies, I tell them just go to the grocery store, get some popcorn. Well, and the prep is easy too. Like there's no, none of this like soaking and simmering and all these different steps. Like it, it used to take me a good, a good 24 hours to do a batch of wheat because you had to soak it overnight and then you had to boil it for a while and then you had to let it sit out and dry. And then you had to, yeah. then you could jar it up and PC it in the corn. I it's boil it, throw it in the jars, PC it and you're done. Yeah. Now. Okay. I do two PCs. My first cook, I just dump a bunch of popcorn in, in the pressure cooker and I PC it for between 18 to 24 minutes, depending upon your altitude. For me, it's about 21 minutes. To, to hydrate it. Just, to, yeah, pressure cook it to yeah. hydrate it at 15 PSI. Um, super fast. Dump it out. I, I let it drain in a strainer and then jar up. I put a little... Uh, uh, vermiculite in the bottom just to, it, in case there's a little extra moisture, it'll suck it up. But it's fast. And boy, uh, there's nothing I hate more than watching triple washed whole oats dry in the sun. It's not my <laughs> idea of a good time. Yeah. I, I can't. Well, I see, I sped, I sped up my popcorn. I, I still boil it for 45 minutes to hydrate it. Uh, oh. Slow, old fashioned boil on the stove. But then I got this portable autoclave thing that heats up to 24. 24 psi and it it sterilizes the grain in 30 minutes and you so, were loving like, that right oh my god it's amazing yeah like it, it it's, a, it's a game changer it. like i'm doing the i'm doing the i'm doing the the agar in in seven minutes uh, yeah. and i mean it's just it's uh, it's smaller like it is smaller like it's uh the inside pot i think is 14 liters is what it's listed but at. they have a big one too right if they i do. remember yours was about this big but they have a they have a it's, giant it's one. more money but they have a it's bigger one 25 i think 25 liters is the, is okay. the size on that one uh it's still which is still not huge but it's bigger mm -hmm. but it's also like 600 bucks so now, are you fine? Do you feel like your that cycle at the higher PSI is yielding you lower contamination rate? Or it's, is it about the same? It's the same. Like it's okay. It's just it's functional. So like you're doing it for you're saving time. It's is the right. benefit. Right. And well, which actually uh if you go by that that time and pressure chart thing that we like to reference all the time, uh we always say, you know, the chart says 90 minutes, but we do 120 just to be safe. According to the chart, I should be, I should be doing at 24 PSI. Well, it, it, it varies. It, 
it it releases at 24 and then closes again when it gets down to 20. Uh, so it stays between the range of 20 and 24. But according to the chart, I should be doing 20 minutes for that. Uh, but I do 30 just to just to round it off and be safe. Uh, and it's yeah, I haven't had any issues with it at all. It's a lot louder than the PC. Uh, it's okay. scary. Uh, plus, it doesn't. It does. You know, the PC is just constantly piff, 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 piff. Uh, this one is silent up until it like all... blasts and and jumps you out of your skin. And no uh, so warning. Yeah, that my animals are not fond of it. Uh, okay. My kids are not fond of it. Uh, it scares me if I'm walking through the kitchen and it goes off. But uh, yeah, I, I saw you post about it, and then I saw immediately several people also get it and go, "Oh my god, this is great!" And it is really a neat machine. Been been thinking about it, although I, I'm still, I don't need it yet. But that well, and I still use my PC too. I kind of go back and forth. It just depends on what I'm doing. Sometimes I want my stuff to sit in there longer because I'm doing other stuff at the same time, and I need, you know, I'll, I'll be ready for that later or whatever, you know. Uh, and I like to use my PC on the outdoor burner too. So if I'm if I'm cooking dinner on the stove and I need you know burners free, then I'll I'll do my right. sterilizing outside. Yeah, the autoclave shuffle. Well, and that that getting getting one of those propane uh, turkey fryer burners is is a cool thing. Uh, I see people asking a lot about like what what kind of hot plate can I use for my PC, and uh, and you can get good commercial hot plates that that will bring it up to temp in a, in a reasonable way, but they're a couple hundred bucks. Like you're not going to get like one for 30 bucks at Walmart no. that can, that can even boil water. Like they're, they're terrible, but that Turkey burner, I mean, if you've got like a, if you use a propane tank for your grill, like it's just, just switch it over to that thing, set your PC on it and let it go. Mm -hmm. And then get yelled at by your wife when you run out of propane for, for dinner. Yeah. Oh well, yeah. But you know, she's going to yell. I mean, I'm just, anyway. I'm hypothesizing not that you're just, Ever. If you give her something to yell about, she won't find something else. So it's, you know, you just pick your battles. That's true. All right. Uh, I got a question for you here. All right. So let's uh, let's move into more platforms. Um, you have quite a following. Uh, Tat Syndicate in general has a great following. Uh, Yoshi, Jick, uh incredible resource incredible uh community individually for you guys and then collectively um have as you've grown have you ever felt like a community can get too big well there's the shroomery group on facebook uh that is mind-bogglingly big I mean, it's like two hundred thousand members uh and and at some point it does become more difficult to manage uh and for the admin team there it's it's like you spend more of your time putting out fires than oh, anything yeah. else because it's just it's just a constant battle even with a small group you've got you know scammers coming in trying to run their scams and stuff and things to watch out for different moderation things but uh i remember someone saying you should have one at least one moderator for every thousand members and that's even a lot to ask of a moderator honestly yeah. uh so you'd need like 200 moderators for the shroomery group at that at that and they don't have it like so it's it's tough it's tough and it, even with that they they do run a good group uh they mm -hmm. they work very hard to keep it focused on task uh they've got a an intelligent rule set that a lot of people complain about but they don't understand the value of that rule set right. like it's it's there for a reason it's there to keep the group focused and and not about nonsense and uh and then if you go into like some of the like like the newer fringe groups, uh, you might find more nonsense than anything else. So yeah. it's 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 a good thing. Like the Tat Syndicate is is a really unique uh, collective, though, because most most groups are are one person's shop basically. Right. Uh, it's I start a group so that I can vend because I tried to vend in somebody else's group and they told me I couldn't. Right. So so you see a lot of that. And and there's nothing wrong with that. Like and and things start that way and they grow, develop organically. Uh, but the Tat Syndicate is kind of unique in that there's multiple experienced growers that work together on things, and and it's not it's not perfect. Like there's problems sometimes. Like people have fallings out. We're we're human, you know. But 
but for the most part, it's probably the most cohesive group of growers working on a, a, a similar project. Uh, it's, it's also the only group, the only group that I know of that's dedicated to a single genetic line, uh, which makes it unique. Uh, but the TAT genetic line is, is so variable. Like when I, when I do a grow from the source print, it usually looks like five or six different things growing in the same tub. And usually you, you see like most of one thing and the occasional weirdo here and there, but this is like an even mix of weird things. Like, and they're all different. Like, it's just a, it's so variable. And yet each one of those things seems to stabilize pretty rapidly into its own thing. So it's just, I don't know what's wrong with that ori original print that Jake sent me, but it's, it's wacky. Yeah. Now, so my first exposure to you guys was one of my very, uh, she was my first mentor. She's the first person who wasn't gatekeeping information. She said, ah, you're doing it wrong. Don't listen to these guys. Uh, here's what you need to do. And as soon as I started listening to her, everything started working out for me. But she said, oh, you got to, you know, I get my genetics from uh, Tass Syndicate. You got to join Tass Syndicate, Tass, Tass Syndicate Genetics. And so I joined and almost immediately I'm sitting here going, wait a minute. These guys are focused specifically on exploring, growing out, developing, isolating. Uh, it was a focused group. And it also seemed, and I want to talk to you about this a little bit later, um, it seemed to operate by a, a set of rules. And it was apparent to me instantly that, sure, maybe there's some occasional drama, but you guys established these rules to set a tone and a culture and expectations for, for the people to operate within the group. And it was hands down the most drama-free group I, I was in. Well, and... Sure. and the the tat the tat group has always been the most open uh, the most transparent as far as yeah. how to do things uh some groups are are mainly focused on sales uh look what i've got you can buy it yep you know but the tat group has always been more focused on like jump in here and do this with us yeah you know you can do this here's what we're doing you can do it too and uh, and and I've kept that. Jick Jick was actually the first person on Facebook that I talked to. I was I was a social media hermit for many years. Uh, I had MySpace, and then I canceled that. And then you know maybe like eight years later, uh, I got on Facebook, and uh, and he was one of the first people I talked to in the mushroom groups, and we hit it off. And uh, we we have kind of like a common like uh, a common goal as far as like sharing what we learn. Like if I learn something, I want to turn around and give it to everybody else, you know, so they can do it too. It's not about gatekeeping. And a lot, there is some gatekeeping, I suppose, mm -hmm. uh, like telling people that you have to have snake venom to do a cross uh, when all you have to do is just have cubensis spores. Uh, but I don't know. I don't know. I just, I, so, I, I, so I think a lot of the... This. A lot of the so, accusation of gatekeeping is people being told things they don't want to hear, and then they get mad and uh, say, well, you're a gatekeeper because you're telling me that I have to follow yes. a tech. Well, yes, that, I, that is true. You don't have to follow a tech, but it's a good idea. If you don't know what you're doing, I'm trying to help you. Like right. it's, it's not like I, I, I don't get any kickback from, from uh, whoever spitballs mono, monotub right. tech that I tell people to use. Like I don't right. get any kind of commission on that. I send them the link. And I tell them, this is a basic monotub setup. It's a good way to do it, you know, and you can do it that way. I don't do it yeah. that way. I do some weird stuff with quarter inch holes drilled in the side of my tubs. Uh, who was, it? I think it was pasty started that like years ago and it never caught on. Uh, but it was a tape free tub where you were just right. drilling small holes instead of having the big holes with the micropore tape. And uh, I, I started doing, I started doing that on my own just cause I got tired of the tape. Like I, I have yeah. a million tiny tubs and it, changing tape on them was a pain in the ass right plus my rabbit yeah. likes to eat the micropore tape i found that out the hard way uh, i kept i kept coming across tubs and i'm like well there's no tape on my tub like what did i forget to put the tape on this one no my rabbit was peeling it off and chewing it like bubble gum wow and i finally caught him in the act uh and and kind of banished him to the living room he's not you allowed grounded to him yeah yeah you gotta ground him um so did you guys ever formally talk about this or did it just sort of organically happen? 
Uh, I mean, was it driven by JIC? Was it a collective decision? Um, I remember early on, uh, one of the rules of the syndicate was, you know, there's a set pricing for, for swab sets so that there wasn't this stupid game of, I'm going to buy your swab set for 20 bucks and resell it for 10 bucks or it, it and Some I just you thought, wow, you guys are, this is really simple, but very smart approach to this. Some of it, some of it has been like, you know, things that just kind of came up, like, because a situation called for it and, and some things have come and some things have go. Uh, but a lot of like the whole, the whole philosophy of the TAT group is, is Jick. He's the, you know, he's the heart of that. Uh, and, and that was one of the reasons that we hit it off so well when we first met was because we both just kind of thought the same way from the start. So we, we both like, it just seemed natural for things to be that way. And then as the group grew, then you kind of have to start encouraging it to people that it might not be natural for, right. like to say, here's how we're doing things. Like we would like you to do it this way also, uh, or you can hit the highway. I mean, you know, yeah. go start your own group. <laughs> the, yeah. Those things that, um, you think should be common sense are just not always common sense or that's just not how somebody was necessarily raised or brought up and so well, hey, common sense for one person might be i'll sell mine for half the price you are so i can sell more of them right so you know people sense. have a different outlook yeah uh, but but quality control was always like our, our our number one thing there we wanted we wanted to vet vendors that we knew were going to be producing a, a clean product right. of you know, carefully selected genetics and not just, you know, I, I grew a tub of it. I don't know what it's supposed to look like, but I swabbed it. Here they are, you know? Right. And, uh, I had, I had a number of people send me swabs to test of different things that they'd grown. Uh, and ghost was the number one thing that people had the hardest time with, uh, cause they, they're a low spore producer and they produce their spores late. So when people go by the standard, well, the, the veil broke, that's not time yet. And so you can swab the hell out of that fruit and you might get lucky and get a piece of gill sample on there that clones out, but uh, there's no spores. Um, so for a while I, I built uh, furniture and uh, when I was in furniture making school, we learned about the arts and crafts movement. And uh, back in the day, there was a company called, I think the Stickley brothers and they used to sell all their furniture, but they also would publish for free in newspapers and magazines plans because back in the day, people knew how to make stuff. Yeah. So, so they would be like, and if you can't afford to buy our, our Morse chair or our side table, here's the plans for it. And you can try to make it yourself. And I remember I had a professor who told me, so don't forget that imitation is a very sincere form of flattery and these and he told the story to to kind of exemplify this idea that instead of thinking to yourself i'm gonna i'm gonna hold this genetic that i have this is mine you can only obtain it from me how dare you think you can grow my you know what i mean you seem, and, and Tat was this way, they were like, let's get the stuff out there. Let's get it grown. Sure, quality control and all that stuff. You want to make sure it's the right stuff. But it helps you. For example, uh, obviously, you are not the only person that is uh, selling Jack Frost swabs. And I sell very little Jack Frost, <laughs> honestly. Uh, Everybody sells Jack Frost swabs. Most people sell more Jack Frost than I do. Probably. And but and I'm okay with that. That's not been bad for you, be, right? Because I grow you're legendary <laughs> for for that for sure. I grow a lot of other things instead. Yes, but but so I guess I I tell that story because I want you to talk a little bit about the mindset of someone who is creating new ge genetics all the time, trying to stabilize them, trying to get them out there, and how it feels or how you treat how do you emotionally handle seeing other people making money off something that you I, legitimately I created i think it's kind of cool 
uh, there were a couple people that uh, that you know messaged me and said, "Look, there's this website selling your selling your Jack Frost. There's a there's a dispensary in Canada selling the actual fruits." Yeah, uh, I think that's cool. I uh, too. They could they could send me a check anytime, and I'd be happy. But uh, <laughs> it's I'm not I'm not holding my breath. Uh, no. I really I, Jack Frost is a it's a beautiful creation, and I like that people appreciate it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and I'm hoping that, you know, like they'll appreciate other things that I do too, you know, but, but I do it. I just, I make these things because I love them. I love to, I love to grow mushrooms. I love to take pictures of them. Uh, I love to tinker with them and see what I can get them to do. And, uh, and I think, I think probably like my biggest joy is, is just like teaching people, like helping people with their grow problems, getting them over the hump. I've had so many people that, you know, we're struggling and, and, and I help them and now they're growing big full tubs and it, it makes me feel good when I see them posting stuff. And if they post up a tub of Jack Frost and they say swabs available, more power to them, you know, like they, they earned that. Mm -hmm. And people have to learn. I I, I mean, you're spreading the spores, you're uh, integrating. One thing I always tell people is I'm very appreciative to have found a way to contribute back to the community that I love. And if you look at it that way, you're, you're not being a taker. You're, you're, you're being a giver. And well, you, you are, you had, you had mentioned something in your, and when we were talking earlier about the things you wanted to talk about, you, you had one thing that asked if, if I was the originator of the ghetto cross. Oh yeah. Yeah. And, and I don't think I am, but I'm definitely, I've definitely helped to Astemble. encourage other people to do it. Like I've, 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 I made it clear with my transparency that this is what I did and it worked. Mm-hmm. And so I, I've definitely promoted it as a, as a, as a, as an option. And I try to let people know that it's not all just instant, you know, right. success. And there is some, there is some work on the back end to identify your, your, fruits and to, to stabilize them and whatnot but i'm glad that people are putting up posts with hey this is this cross with this and this is this cross with that and and it, it's whether they're new crosses or just a mutation or whatever there's something new there's still something significant and and different from what they had before and uh and yeah it, it does make things complicated like i get i get problems with my spore menu uh with my swabs uh, it's a really long list and it is. probably, yeah. probably three quarters of them are things that I made. Mm-hmm. And, and so like people get the list and they're like, well, I don't know what any of these are. And I'm like, well, you just haven't been following along then because I've been posting all, right. of them, you know, but some of them, some of them you might not have seen in a while. <laughs> you know, you got to go back a ways, yeah. but uh, it, it, it's, it's not so good from a sales perspective because people take forever to get through to me and my messages and then when they finally get through to me and i give them the list they're like i'm gonna have to come back uh after i look at these for a while <laughs> okay know? stop talking about me because that's exactly what i did to you <laughs> <laughs> i got this list and i'm like what the fuck i thought i knew all the mushrooms that existed out here i, I didn't you know i was a good boy i studied this shit and i'm like man i never seen half of this stuff if uh, if i have a strength it's it's in my my work ethic like i i'm not I don't do anything really fancy. Like as far as growing goes, I use very basic growing techniques, the same simple text that everybody uses for their beginner grows. I just do a lot more of it yeah. and, and use a lot more varieties at once. And so I've, and, and it, it snowballs. Like, so mm-hmm. when I first started out, I had, you know, three things that I bought and now I've got, I don't even know how many things I've got. Right. And each one of those things branches off and turns into multiple things. And uh, it's, it's a hot mess. Like yeah. I just, I, it's kind of like a juggling act. Like, I don't know what's going to be on grain until I go to get the plates. And then I'm like, oh, hey, look at this, you know? And right. and then I, I forget what's coming up until it ends up in a tub. And then I'm like, hey, look what I grew. I didn't even know this was coming. Right. Uh, but I, it's it's fun, you know? And I, I enjoy doing it. And even if I wasn't in the business of marketing the, the, the spore swabs at all, like, I would still just be doing it for my own entertainment, you know? Right. I just would have less time for it because I'd be at a restaurant all day, like, yelling at waiters and cooks and stuff yeah uh i remember talking one time i i'm pretty sure it was yoshi um and i i asked him i said so what the fuck is dave doing to get so 
many new varieties. What is a secret? Um, I know Cadaverus made made a comment about like the theories on the gene pool included uh, your houses over an Indian burial ground. I think yep. you made a joke about being over a, 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 a vein of uranium. But Yoshi said, he goes, I think he goes back to spores a lot. And I think he just grows a lot of tubs. And I, everything I, I've heard I, you say, I think that is probably. I, I grow I grow a lot of tubs. They're all very small tubs. So I, I can fit a whole lot of them in a small area. And I've yeah. I've kind of like refined this system over the last few years for speed, like I was talking about. Mm -hmm. Like when I'm trying to get like faster fruiting so I can work through these generations. Because. Right. When I was doing big tubs, like 30, 30 quart and up tubs, it would really take me like a good year to get through four or five generations of a project just because there was so much time spent waiting on colonization, waiting on fruiting. And then like I'd be running that tub like all the way until it was like through three or four flushes before I dumped it. And now with this like rapid fruiting, rapid turnover thing I've gotten, it's, it's cut that, that time down. I can do four or five generations in six months now. Yeah, that's great. And so, and, and a lot of it is numbers, uh, not just the number of tubs, but uh, the number of spores, because I'm also starting with the multi-spore plate. Like more often than not, all my grows are from the initial swab plate. I'm not doing any transfers to refine the mycelium or whatever. I'm trying to grow everything that it's got. And then, and then add the number of tubs to that. And then, and then uh there's plates involved. So I got plates and I've got a bunch of stuff on plates and I only make one plate of any given thing. Like I don't make the, I'm going to do five plates to make sure they all make it. I do one and that one plate's probably going in the grain. Right. So that way I can put something else on the next plate, but it is, it's a numbers thing. And, and, and I run a lot of varieties at once and I run a lot of spores from each variety in each, in each grow. So uh, there's just more opportunities to, to find different things. As far as the albino thing goes, I, I don't know. That might be the five G tower. I'm not sure, uh, but I do I do seem to find albinos in things that don't generally produce them. You really do. It's true. Um, all right. Okay. I have just some simple. Uh, you know, everybody I'm sure asks you. Mushroom, 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 mushroom. So I'm going to ask some personal questions. Sushi or Mexican food? I know. Is there Mexican sushi? I'm, I'm not making it easy for you. If there could be Mexican sushi. Like there could be a fusion. The, oh, there is. Have you not had a sushi burrito <laughs> before? Well, there's there's a place here in, in, in town where I live called CoFusion, and it's all like new age sushi like yeah. different like combination things mm -hmm. uh like i probably butter and sushi. jelly sushi mm -hmm. I, I i i spent i spent time when i was in the military i spent time in hawaii and mm -hmm. i got used to very fresh feet, seafood out there yeah and uh i like raw meat uh I'm with you. I, I eat raw beef i eat raw chicken i eat raw fish and it's all good and it's all sushi okay all I've right next next question. salmonella i don't think well, you're still here. So not every chicken has salmonella. It's yeah. salmonella is not all bad. It's it's salmonella combined with food being left outside of the proper holding temperature long enough for it to propagate and and reproduce yeah. and get itself to toxic levels. Like there's 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 different things involved. But if you eat really fresh chicken, it's it's good. Now, where are you eating raw chicken at though? My house mostly. Oh, okay, okay. They don't serve it anywhere. <laughs> no. Like, how do you prepare raw chicken? This is. It's already ready. Okay, you're right. It is. <laughs> it's just, it's just meat. Okay. All right. It tastes better than you think. The texture's a little funny. Uh, -huh. uh the taste is just chicken. It tastes like yeah. chicken. It's just, it's cold, wet, chicken. Okay. Okay. All right. How about? Uh, oh yeah, somebody said ceviche. Um. How about this one's slightly mushroom related? If you ended up being stuck on a deserted island and you could only bring one variety of mushroom with you to grow, to hopefully, yeah, you know, you're you're going to Mars, you're gonna recall it's it's not an island, forget the island. 
you're you're recolonizing uh, Mars with with mushrooms. You can only they only have room on the the rocket ship for one variety. I, I'd probably bring that that tat source print because it's capable of everything. Like they're, okay. they're and they're, that was a golden teacher, correct? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Just uh, right. some, so a it, golden it teacher really... with something wrong with it. Like it I, back. I wish I could see the fruit that print came from. Like, cause I did, I mean, obviously it was a printable fruit. It uh -huh. produced a, a print, but, uh, but the things that come from it are just mind boggling. Although print. I've started to find, I used to think that was a very unique thing with the tat, but I've, I've found now that, uh, I've, I've got some Huautla that's very, very versatile. Mm -hmm. that I've gotten a few good things out of. And then this Mexican red spore that we were talking about earlier. Yeah, that one. Like just, I mean, just a wide variety of different phenotypes coming out of it in a very short amount of time. I mean, the, the, those, those albino ones with the, with the moral morel mushroom gills, gills. they're, that's, that's only four generations from the original red spore. Like, I mean, just, and drastically different. So, so that, that's, that's kind of a fun one too. But the, but the tat, the tat is, is hands down yeah. still the king of a variety for sure. It really is. All right. Uh, we're at about the time where I think we should open it up to viewer questions. So if you guys out there got any questions, uh, you know, on the live stream here uh, on the right, you should be able to uh, punch in your question and we'll get it up on the screen. Yeah, and if, 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 if while we're doing that, if you want to throw up that variety slideshow, we can just kind of slowly oh, post yeah, through that. Do that. And that's just, that's just a sampling of different phenotypes. That one. Yep. There we go. Okay. From, which actually this picture here, this is, uh, this is also from that Mexican red spore. This is a, I, I just labeled this one Mexican, but it's a purple spored regular cubensis that came out of that Mexican red spore. And it's very, very normal. It looked normal. And then this is your uh now, so is this your OG tat or is that's this... that's the wombat tat? That's uh, the wombat, which, okay. Which it, it, it probably about a year, maybe two years after Jick found his his OG tat, which was just tat up until I had mine, then we had to put a little name on it to keep them apart. But uh, but this one's mine. So so same source genetics, but different isolation. All right. Ooh. This was the this was the first. This was my. Uh, it says it says Odisha on the tag on that tub, but that's because I didn't peel the tape off. Uh, this is <laughs> this is Colombian rust spore, or okay. it was supposed to be Colombian rust spore, but it grew this this albino PE type thing, and. Okay. Uh, and that's what it's continued to grow ever since. Oh, the clockwork orange. This is a good one. This, this is this, a good one. The, the, the clockwork tat was a, I believe it was a Yeti mutation. It was like a really short, fat Yeti with a very crinkled up cap. Like it, it was so wavy that it looked like a gear wheel. Uh, and I was working on that up until I had my, my surgery uh, a year and a half ago. And when I got back out of the hospital, all my tubs had died and, and gotten weird. And so when I restarted it, it produced this orange capped mutation. And, and I went ahead and stabilized that into the clockwork orange. Uh, it doesn't have the clockwork trait of the gear wheel shaped cap. It has more of a helmet with a, a nice mm -hmm. wavy edge. But, uh, but coming from the clockwork and being orange, uh, it has a catchy name, yeah. which I couldn't pass up. No, you can't. I mean, I've talked to people where they, they literally have a name and then they go, well, but what fruit should I, how, how can I make the mushroom for the name that I want to have? <laughs> and at that point, I'm like, no, no, no. <laughs> it, it, it is it is a hard game. Like there's there's marketing involved with it. Like yes. you want it to be catchy. Uh, you don't want it to be like horrible sounding where people aren't going right. to want it. Uh, but but it should it should fit the fruit either descriptively right. or or in some way reference its its heritage mm -hmm. its origins uh, and so i try to i try to get a good mix of that with my naming where where they're not just like i'm just going to name it bill because i like the name bill right you know that's cool too i mean um uh, jack I frost was an easy one because of the colors like the the white and blue just it, it looked frosty to me oh yeah that, i mean that's just like that's the case study of of how to name and and isolate a fruit for sure 
Which one is this? Oh, this is the this is the KSAT squats. These are this say. is this was this was like my my who was the the guy from the from the King Arthur's Tales that had the, the questing beast? Uh Sir Galahad or somebody, I think it was. Okay. But he had this this quest, this eternal quest to capture this beast that was always just out of reach, like he could never catch it. Uh but th this was mine. Uh I I I did the cross with the KSSS squats and the tat. Mm -hmm. And obviously I wanted this, but it, it eluded me for two years. Uh, I was chasing all kinds of different golden capped phenotypes. Uh, it never did the same thing twice from one tub to the next. I went through like seven or eight generations of it before I just gave up and went back to the very first generation spores uh, from the cross. And I got the, the squatty mushrooms on the first try. Wow. And I was See, that it that is a great uh that's a great story for when in doubt go back to spores well, because and and that's i still wasn't really thinking on the big picture back then but i was just thinking they're in there somewhere so i'm just going to keep looking for them but yeah. as long as you're chasing that line away from them right. you're just getting further and further from it like it's right. it's not going to pop back up later it's it's you're just you're you're down a different path at this point uh that's a good way of looking at it but but i the the KSSS squats have been my all-time favorite for like over a decade. Uh, their little pumpkin shapes are bizarre looking. They make great pictures. They're god awful strong. Uh, they're just they're mm -hmm. dense. Like the the core of the of the fruit is like a like a walnut. Like it's like yeah. like solid meat. I so I have a friend, uh, a dear friend in mycology, who just uh, tried them for the first time. And he came back basically saying like he's a changed man. These are the holy grail. Um, <laughs> and I've I have had many people tell me they're one of their favorites or amongst their favorites. But he came back and was just like, this was the defining experience. It, it will never be outdone. Well, and that's that's what that's what got me interested in the mushroom genetics in the first place was the KSSS squats because yeah. they were not only just so different looking, but they hit like a ton of bricks too. Yeah. Like they're just. I, I have a problem when I eat those more than with any other variety of time stopping and starting. Like it'll freeze, okay. like time just kind of freezes and then it catches up and then it goes a little too fast and then it, and it slows down again. And it's just like uh, time dilation, I call it. Uh -huh. uh, and it, it just, it's, you're already perplexed because everything's all kaleidoscope around you anyway, but that doesn't help. So he didn't quite say time dilation, but he said that, and he didn't use the term ego death, but he just said he, who he was, was, uh, gone. He said, I just, I was just an existing being and, uh, it was amazing. And he's like, I, I, it didn't bother me at all. And, uh, so yeah, he said he'd never had that, that loss of identity very specifically the way he did with those. The, the last time that I ate them, I distinctly remember I was sitting in my chair, but I was a few inches in front of my body. Like I was <laughs> okay. like separated, like, uh -huh. like my spirit had come out. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I was, and I was thinking about the Star Wars franchise and, and I was, you know, very proud of having come up with the whole idea for it. <laughs> and I was actually supposed to be getting an award for it but I couldn't get up to go up on stage to collect my award because I couldn't get back into my body. Oh, wow. Like I was just, I was just a few inches in front of myself and I couldn't get back into it. And by the time I did, I, I realized I didn't come up with star Wars. Disappointing. Just Does that, that's a hard come down. It, it is. To go it from is. thinking you came up with star Wars to you didn't. Yeah. That, yeah. I, right. it's, dashed i was very into star wars when i was a little kid oh um, yeah i mean our era for sure yes okay now here's the here's the here's the blue ring jack frost again uh this one is choco tat this was this is this is a cross of el choco and tat and it came out uh i just had a grow of these that i posted in the group the other day uh the caps don't have the hairy texture uh mm -hmm. they just got like a kind of a, a sunburst fade like a standard thing but a nice ripple to them but they're they're calling card and i don't have it in this picture unfortunately is that the the gills get black with spores 
they have like really heavy spore production, but they have zero spore ejection. So you have these like stark white stems and these very dark gills. And the contrast is just very eye catching. Uh, plus, they don't make a mess, which I'm a big fan of. Uh, uh, man, you keep you can send me some of those. I I will work those because that is a very desirable trait. It is they're I mean, they're they're somewhat similar to normal cubes, but they're slower. I mean, they are a little bit weird because you, you know they got to slow down to get that spore ejection to stop. Yeah. But they are a very nice one, uh, and I don't they're not really in very wide circulation yet because I. And, and what are these called again? This is Choco Tat. Choco Tat. Okay. It just a combination of the parent names. Nothing. Uh, yep. Nothing fancy there. Uh, oh, Emir. This is Emir is is a very Jack Frosty looking, yeah. but this is an isolation from the Tat source genetics. So it's pure golden oh. teacher genetics. Uh, wow. It started from a, a grow of the Tat source genetics, and one large albino fruit grew before the rest of the tub even started to pin. And Emir is the is the first living being in Norse mythology. He was the ancestor of all the gods and giants, uh, and so that's where the name came from. Was from this first. Nice. first giant fruit that came out uh so the second grow uh was cloned from that first fruit and then another giant fruit grew before the, all the other ones but not not the, am i skipping ahead here not not the, yeah yeah this is them. Okay, this is this is a different one so we're still on emir here okay so for the first couple of generations each generation was started from the first large fruit that appeared uh just important to kind of keep with that theme um Oh, my battery's getting low. Uh, I will run and grab my charger. I'll be right back. Cool. Yeah. All right, guys, let's take a look at some of the questions we got going here. Um, let me scroll back. I got one from Village Bobcat. Uh, we'll do this one. Oh, no, I'm sorry. What did I do? Hi, Village Bobcat, though. Uh, all right, we're going to do this one from Derek Carroll. All right, I'm going to do PM3 question. Ooh, this is a good question from Sporagon Supply. Oh, yeah. Phil, all I know is uh, he likes some good music, so we're going to definitely ask your question. And I'll, I'll do... Uh, Yuval, I will do your question about sub. All right, man, I got a bunch of questions. Let him get his. We're getting wired up here. Getting wired up. We did good. We're just, you know, we're going long. It's a very small laptop, so it has a very small battery. Oh, that's fine. All right, we've got juice. All right, so let me. Okay, we'll keep going here. Let's get through these slides. Okay, okay. This is the, this is a project I, I entitled White Dwarf. It's also a tat uh, isolation. What what makes this one unique though is that the pins start off very golden. Uh, you can see the small pins there are, are very very orangish yellow, and then that kind of diffuses as they grow until they end up all white by the time they're full grown. But they're they're a very short, squatty tat. Um, when I, uh, I I did a grow of them just recently and they came out skinny, uh, so I tossed that one and I'm going to get restarted on it. But this one hasn't been fully stabilized yet. But it's 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 one of those ones that's constantly in the works. And it's a it's it is a unique color because it's it's white, but there's a there's hint still of a that golden orange. hue. Yeah, it does have like kind of a golden hue to it. Yeah. This is like one of my favorite pictures. It's this um, <laughs> ever picture uh, on the right. Uh, I believe is is just regular Cambodian, okay. uh, and then on the left is uh, is uh, Tambino. This is one of my one of my projects from the Tam Cross, which is Tat Melmac, uh, the same cross that produced Gandalf and Pearly Gates. Okay, uh, and this is just a it, it's a good contrast uh, for that whole cube is a cube thing, right? Uh, because a cube is a cube, but some are bigger, right? You can have big cubes and little cubes. But just the just the the contrast in the oh, yeah. the little skinny the little skinny stems versus the the xenomorph on the other side. It's crazy. 
Uh, this one is, uh, this is TAT X1. This is another isolation from the TAT source genetics, but it's a silver capped, uh, a silver capped TAT. Yeah, it almost looks like the the cap the lunch lady wore when I went to high school <laughs> and elementary the, the, school. Yeah, shower caps. Yeah, like a shower cap. Yeah, but we got El Choco. You can't Choco. can't miss that one. Uh, this is Silver Surfer. This is another Tam isolation. Uh, they they grow long and kind of swirly, but not as thick as the Tambino. Uh, the Tambino has has a wider cap and, and a thicker. A more thicker stipe, but the silver surf is a fun one. Uh, I just had a girl of these come up too. Oh, Ragnarok! This I don't is. I think this, I've seen this one. Uh, this this is a this is a cross of Crooked Mystery, which is a, an unlabeled swab somebody sent me that never identified or would. I mean, it came in an unmarked envelope. Like, I don't know who it came from or what it is. I asked in a bunch of groups when I first threw it out. Nobody could identify it. Uh, but Crooked Mystery is a is a very big, growing, weird fruit. Like, it gives you, like, just a few fruits, but they're huge. And this is Crooked Mystery crossed with Yeti. So the the outcome produced two different, That's awesome. two different things. It's got this phenotype, which I labeled Ragnarok, which is a, just a big, crusty... Uh, ragnarok looking mushroom and then now, the other what, one, what are these weigh typically what's the range i don't even know these are solid though they're they're like bricks and again it's not it doesn't produce a whole lot of them it just produces a few but they're they're pretty stout and then there's another there's another isolation from that same cross that grows completely different that'll show up in one of these other slides uh that's not it that's that's oh that's my butthole uh the, the butthole Wait, what, so what, what are these though this is this is the KSAT squats again. This is, okay. this is the KSAT albino squats. This is this is butthole MVP. Uh, MVP uh, was started by Jick. It was one of his early crosses. Uh, it was a Tat Melmac, and uh, and this is my more recent evolution of it. Has obviously developed buttholes on the caps, uh, which why wouldn't you want that? I mean, it's hey uh, sphincter caps. I like them. It's you know I. It doesn't really do anything that I know of. Uh, maybe it would catch raindrops out in the wild. I don't know, you know, but it's cool. But it's it's an example of just I saw something and I went for it and I caught it. They're like Pokemon. Like yeah. if 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 there's a trait and I can get it to repeat, it. I'm going to. Uh, there's the albino so chocolate guy. crinkle again. Uh, I I called this one the space chicken. Okay. Uh, just because I really don't know how else to describe it yeah i think i can see two eyes there maybe i see the mouth okay i, I see space chicken I, I i saw more like the universe imploding on itself as well, well you know this, space chickens don't have they they don't have gravity to to arrange their structures so they just kind of they're kind of amorphous oh okay so this one this one's been kind of problematic this is my brass monkey uh the ape that was used for the Jack Frost cross, when I lost it and I tried to restart it, this is what I got. So okay. they're golden capped, yeah. uh, but they're not spore droppers. They're still ape slow, but just a completely different morphology. Like it oh, just yeah. mutated completely off the map. And I grew this out uh, for a good four or five generations before I let anybody have the spores. And then uh, the results people have had from it are kind of mixed. Some people are getting a mix of golden and albinos. Uh, one person had a grow of golden caps, but they were very thick, stout, like more ape-shaped uh, than my little bottle caps here. Uh, and then Yoshi uh, had a grow of them that came out completely albino. Uh, so it's, you know, it, it repeated successfully for me several times, and then it didn't. Uh, which can happen. I've got another tub of them actually uh, going now again, finally, uh, and they're coming up looking like like these did when they started. So I'm happy about that. Okay. This See, is that, not that. Hold, hold on, that that does suggest that there's something maybe in your location influencing I, that. It could be environmental, you know. But I mean, if it, I, I don't know. This is this is Nanook, uh, Nanook of the North. Uh, this is the other crooked mystery Yeti cross, and you can see it's totally different from the Ragnarok as far as its look goes. Oh yeah, uh, it 
this one this one starts off looking like yeti uh with the closed like white albino like kind of bullet caps uh but then the caps end up spreading out at the end and uh they do have a really lovely blue shift to them yeah i like them they remind me of a their stature is a little different but they remind me of like uh ape 221 or uh even some 412 grows that i've seen well and these do have a little bit of color to them too besides the besides the blue and white the centers of the caps are are oh, yeah. kind of like a like a like a brownish cream color see that. uh it's it's a little more visible before the blue sets in but uh but they do have some color to them when they're when they're fresh oh this is the tat black cap this one has been like the biggest thorn in my side uh, from the beginning. Like probably one of the strongest mushrooms you could possibly eat, uh, but some of the worst spore production ever. Like I've grown whole batches where I disassembled entire caps and couldn't find a single spore under the microscope, uh, which has really slowed down the ability to share it. Uh, people are more comfortable with culture sharing now than they were a few years ago so it's probably possible that more people could be growing tbc if they're getting plates of it instead of swabs uh, but more often than not when i grow a batch of it swabbing it doesn't do any good like and i'm not going to waste anybody's time if, if i can't find spores under the microscope i'm not swabbing yeah uh, but we're still working on this one uh tim pig uh has probably had the most success with uh spore production from his tbc and he's got some great looking ones with very nice dark caps uh, but I'm I'm back to the drawing board on mine. Now, I accidentally grew these one time. I had a uh, a bag of ghost, and about a third of the corner was all these guys. And so I well, messaged Yoshi, and I was like, "What is this? Do I have something new?" He goes, "Oh no, well it just looks like you got some some black caps gone." Well, and, and it is uh, the original TBC is a mutation from ghost. Yeah. But it, when when Jick was growing them, they were tiny. I mean, like like teeny teeny tiny like little bitty fruits like okay. like so small that he like pretty much gave them to me to work with because he was tired of looking at them uh and i got the size up a little bit but then the spore production fell off so they, they've kind of just been like a hmm. like a ongoing project that hasn't really really found itself too well yet uh james cruz actually had some had some decent luck with them though too like there are some there are some people out there that have oh, gotten man. them running i just haven't Uh, this would be El Blanco, which is okay. albino El Chaco. Nice. Because yeah, I turn everything albino, even the dark mushroom. Like I'm working on trying to get the darkest mushroom in the world, and it gives me a white one. Uh, this this is one of the earlier grows of it, and it, it held on to a lot of the El Choco morphology. Uh, but later generations have just gotten real strange and Dr. Seussish, uh, really bizarre like shapes and and very very roughly wavy caps on the newer ones uh the caps kind of take on like a star shape uh they're, they're huh. really neat but but this was this was the the first generation from spore and they still were like basically white el choco at that point yeah they look like the the wad of pizza dough before you you, you know you turn it into a, <laughs> that's what it reminds me of like throw it up in the air and spin yeah. it yeah uh, these these little lovelies were uh, GT squats. These were uh, another another isolation from the tat source genetics. Uh, just some, they were very small. I mean, the caps on these are probably just a little bit bigger than a penny. Uh, okay, yeah, small. But I was trying to isolate these, and the next generation grew uh, gigantic, like arm-sized log mushrooms. So this this one hasn't uh, hasn't really panned out either, but uh, it made for a couple nice pictures. Oh yeah, that's gorgeous. Uh, this would be AMVP. This is the albino version of MVP. Uh, it, it grows a lot different, and it's it's evolved some from from this early stage. But they were they were like my first silver capped like love affair, and I've had a a, a thing for silver capped mushrooms ever since. Like if I see something with silver on the caps, I'm on it. Uh, but this is also, it comes from the same Tat Melmac cross. Uh, it was the original MVP first, the pigmented version, and then these came out as a, a little side mutation from that. I just got these from somebody, so I, I'm looking forward to growing these for sure. They probably won't look like this. Uh, the newer ones are, are 
different looking. They tend to have wavier, uh, whiter, wavier caps. Yeah, the, the caps are, the, the picks he had, they were a little bit whiter. Yeah. I'm still excited, Grom. Ooh, this is this? Loki. Uh, Loki, this is another uh, another Norse mythology name because uh, Loki came out as a, as a mutation from Ymir, uh, okay. which Ymir is the giant, it's like giant Jack Frost, basically. Like with the with the wavy okay. the blue gills and but a, a big bumpy stipe, uh, and, and Loki was one fruit that just had like a like a rounded helmet cap, and he didn't open up like the other ones did. Okay. And immediately in the next generation, uh, it evolved into these, and it's been like these ever since. But this is another this is another spore production issue uh, variety. Uh, these caps don't open; uh, they stay like this. And the little bit of gap around the bottom of the cap is sealed up by the veil. And the veil is thick, like a, like a vinyl, wow. like it's really thick, rubbery veil. And I'm starting to think that possibly that veil is preventing airflow from getting into the gills to allow the spores to, to develop properly. So on my next grow from these, I'm going to try and like peel the veils off early uh, to see if that access to air improves the spore production on them. Uh, but besides being not cooperative, they're fantastic little mushrooms. I mean, they're short, they're stubby, they're rubbery, they're solid. Uh, and, and they're, they're kind of like in the ghost slash TBC kind of family, as far as like growth speed and, and size and whatnot. So I expect they're probably about as potent as well. Yeah. I like those. That that blue ring around the bottom of the cap is oh, just yeah. it's lovely. Uh, this is the chocolate crinkle again. Yeah. Uh, the monstrosity. Uh, this this uh, this is the OGPE thick ISO. Uh, when I started uh, working the OGPE again, I immediately started trying to capture different traits from it. And this one, the the caps get a nice like black ring around the outside edge, and they pretty universally have that white crustiness in the center of the cap. Uh, this one, the small fruit on the right, you see, it's got a little bit of rose comb on top too. I, I actually had a fruit that looked like the larger fruit, but the white part, instead of just being a snow cap, it actually was a spore producing surface. Uh, it turned purple when, uh, mm -hmm. when it produced spores. And so this fruit grew spores on top of the cap as well as underneath it, but it wasn't rose comb. It didn't look like gills. It just looked like a, like a fuzzy spot in the center of the cap, but just made out of spores. Uh, this would be my uh, Odisha, my albino Odisha squats. Uh, the the Orissa India is a, a traditional regional variety that everybody knows, uh, but the the state of India changed its name to Odisha back in 2011 uh, to reflect the local pronunciation in their language, wow. uh, and so I started calling mine by that name as well. And I caught a lot of heat from a lot of people in the community about it. They're like, "You can't change the name." I'm like, uh, "You can't change the name. Like, how about that?" It's it's a regional name. Like, why don't you call it where it's from? You know, it's not it's not a brand name like Doritos. It's 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 a place. Uh, but uh, the Orissa or Odisha, as as you would call them with my new terminology, is traditionally a, a big regular cube, golden capped, uh, spore dropping cube. But it tends to grow large fruits, and uh, it also grows very squatty, ape like things if you let it. So. That's, I have yeah, I haven't seen these either. Those look cool. These are these are a neat one too because they're you know how you squeeze things to see if they're if they're done. Mm -hmm. Uh these are like squishy marshmallows pretty much their whole life. They have like a really light fluffy texture. They're like the marshmallow peeps of mushrooms. Uh and so and do they're you not, just harvest them when when the cap curls like that or when when the gills turn blue. Uh but they're yeah, they're just they're very light and and fluffy. They're solid all the way through. They're not hollow. But they just have a really a really puffy consistency to them. Nice. This would be Maria Sabina. This is my this is my my top shelf uh, Huatla isolation. Uh, the the fruits grow very similar to the chupacabra fruits in that they start off small and skinny with closed caps, and, and then go through a, a late growth spurt where they just blow up basically and get yeah. like much much bigger at the end. Uh, but the the real distinguishing characteristic on these is the gills are just so roughly and 
uneven. Like they just they're, they're like pom poms when they finish. Just it. gonna say, man, I just picked up my daughter from cheerleading, and <laughs> I think that I think she had some of these. And then they're very stiff, like wooden, like fruits too. The stems are very solid as well. But it's 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 you know the. And this was another one where people told me, like, when I first announced that I was going to name it Maria Sabina, uh, they were like, well, they don't use the cubes for their ceremonies. They use, you know, wood lovers and, and whatever else. And I'm like, well, I'm aware of that, but this isn't a regular cube anymore. And and it's only named out of deference uh, for the role that she played in bringing psilocybin to modern science right. by allowing Western scientists to participate in their ceremony. Because the 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 natives in, in Mexico had to keep that stuff hidden for the longest time because the Spanish persecuted them. Uh, you know, the Spanish are very, uh, the conquistadors, whatever they, they're very, uh, very Catholic. Uh, any kind of entheogenic use was forbidden. Uh, any kind of religious, anything other than Catholicism was punishable by death. So, so mushroom use, sacred mushroom use in Mexico was kept secret for a really long time. Uh, and if you weren't in the in crowd, like you just weren't going to know about it because that was what they had to do to, to keep it safe. Uh, and then Maria Sabina, she she opened up to to uh, to Wasson when he came down there and and he sent samples back to Europe and they synthesized psilocybin and they started this whole thing that we have now. Like we wouldn't we wouldn't yeah. be doing what we were doing without this lady. And oh, we might have been, but it would have taken longer. And so, and so I named it after her, uh, and in doing so, I upset a few people that knew who she was, but I also got a whole lot of people to read up on her and find out who she was that didn't ever hear of her before. So I feel like it's a good thing. And plus it's a, just an awesome mushroom. Like there's just, that's a really freaking cool mushroom. Uh, Yoshi actually had a batch of them that grew like thin brain things. And oh, it I also, think I saw that, yeah. like 2.9 or something like that. Uh, wow. 2.09, I think, on the HBLC testing. Uh, so very, very strong. And slow, right? And slow. Yeah. And slow. All right. So I'm scrolling back here. I got a bunch of questions. We're going to go. Okay. So I'm going to go all the way back. I forgot who asked it, but they wanted to know where they could get their ready to buy one year tapestries. Uh, well, this one's from Wish. Okay, so and uh, I, I had some tapestries printed up a while back, and uh, just a couple as a tester to see, you know, to check the check the quality of the work and whatnot, mm -hmm. and uh, and so I got like two, two kinds made and, and ten copies of each one, and I and I sold all those, uh, but then the company that uh, that made them for me, uh, they got kicked off of Alibaba because they got caught uh, violating some copyright uh. Uh, printing things that they weren't supposed to. Uh, and so they told me, uh, we'll still print stuff for you, but we don't have the buyer assurance thing that uh, Alibaba right. has anymore. And I'm like, well, uh, you know, right. I don't know about that. I think I'll find a different vendor. But uh, but they did do some good print quality. But I do have a number of designs worked up that I, I do plan on getting made into tapestries at some awesome. point. Uh, just, I'm you know, I'm always juggling a million different things. <clears throat> yeah. Okay, I got one here. Meantime, Wish does have some great tapestries. Uh, they really do. They have, yeah, I I bought some, some shockingly inexpensive, nice items from them. Yeah, and they've got uh, when you when you when you fail on wish, it's when you're trying to buy something that should be really expensive and isn't, and you should know better. Mm -hmm. Like if they have like a like a DJ mixer table for twelve bucks, yeah, and it's not gonna be what you want, right. <laughs> or like a. a 120 cc motorcycle for sixteen dollars. Yeah, it's just yes, yeah, doesn't work. All right, this is a personal question from Phil. Uh, what's your preferred lab music? Raga jungle drum and bass. Nice. Always. Although I mean, I mix it up a little bit. I listen to a lot of uh, UK grime. Uh, I listen to Norwegian black metal. Uh, I listen to jazz. I listen. I listen to all kinds of stuff. Uh, I like the classics, the old Led Zeppelin and Pink Floyd stuff. Uh, really, a pretty wide mix. But nice. but as far as like work music goes, the the jungle drum and bass usually comes in an hour plus long format. Right. Uh, it's it's almost always a mixtape, 
And so it's it's continuous, seamless music from start to finish. And, and I like that. I like that. I like that groove. Nice. All right, here we go. Got a question from Sporagon Supply. Or should I say Sporagon? Because you don't say Oregon. You say Oregon. So Sporagon Supply. Have any of your crosses produced scler scleria? Sclerosia. 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 Like, 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 like a the, stone. The, like the stones. A tamponensis. No. Uh, I, I've gotten some things in jars that I thought maybe might have been sclerosia, but it was really just a blob uh, from letting the jar sit too long, you know, and it was just trying to grow something. Uh, but but no, I haven't I haven't gotten anything like that. And I've really done very limited uh, other species. I've started a few things on agar, but I, I haven't gotten anything growing yet of anything other than cubensis okay. and a couple of gourmets. I've done some gourmets, but uh, but uh, ATL seven or or Tampanensis or whatever you want to call it. It's the same thing. Uh, I, I do have some of that culture going and I do plan on trying to fruit some of those. I've got some uh, uh, Zapotecorum that is going to be going down next. Nice. Uh, a few a few other weird, obscure things. Awesome. All right. I got one uh, from PM3. Can you talk about the best method to use spore prints? Uh, well, you can put them on your hat and uh, walk around outside like uh, Paul Stamets. Uh, mm -hmm. That was uh, that was in one of his books, uh, but that's probably not the most effective. Uh, uh, it's just kind of I think he was just being silly. Uh, but uh, for me, uh, when I do prints, uh, there's I don't I don't know there's there's a there's a billion plus spores on one of those things so you know and do you, only do, you do you swab it do you like swab a little I use, bit of it i up? use my i use my scalpel you do and, okay you just scrape and i i literally like like nick the print like just mm -hmm. a tiny touch and even that'll pick up like potentially hundreds of spores from a decent right. print and then i'll touch that to the center of the agar plate I don't streak it and spread it around because uh, okay. I, I don't do that. I don't do that looking for colonies to select thing. I grow it out and send it all. So right. I just put it in the middle and it grows out radially. And you can choose sectors from there too, you know, because it'll grow in one direction or the other. Uh, but with any multi-spore isolation, you know, we, we talk about like, oh, well, there's a, a billion spores on there. So you have potentially a, a billion mm -hmm. different genetic combinations. Most of them are going to be about the same. Like they're different breeding types, but they have the same basic information in them. So you're not going to see a whole lot of variety there. But but then there's also that that uh, that diamond mating. So you they start off as monocarions until they meet another monocarion and become a dicarion. Then that dicarion spreads faster than the monocarions right. and basically incorporates all the monos that it runs into on its way out. So what you end up with is is basically like one one major strain and then like a couple of substrains that are somewhat related to it. But, but typically in your grow, you're only going to see one major kind of fruit and then maybe a couple other oddities right. here and there. You're never going to see like a hundred different varieties in the same tub. Uh, well, and if you did, you wouldn't be able to tell because most of them grow the same anyway. But, but I like to, I just like to touch it in the center of the plate and let it grow out from there. Uh, and if it's going to grow contam, then it's going to grow contam. Uh, but hopefully, hopefully it's not. But if it does and it grows out, usually the contam ends up on one side and you get some growth popping out the other side. You just transfer from there. Nice. All right. Got uh, one from Derek Carroll. What land race genetic uh, would you like to explore next? Ooh, ooh, ooh. All of them. <laughs> I mean, I, for a while, because uh, that's all I grew for the first 10 years mm -hmm. was was B plus Cambodian and I had Ecuadorian and then I dropped Ecuadorian and replaced it with something else basic, but another basic variety. Uh, I got tired of them and then and then I got the, I got those KSSS squats and then that's what I focused on for a long time after that. But and then and then like the whole tat thing started happening and then like it was albinos and then it was like right. chocolate crinkle mutants and I was like. To hell with the regular ones; they all suck. But I've kind of gotten back into a uh, like a nostalgic phase where I'm starting to grow these old varieties again, and starting to look at them in a new way that I didn't look at them before. Mm -hmm. Where before, 
like I said, for the first 10 years or so, all I cared about was keeping them the same. And I would fight tooth and nail to keep these things from changing. Like I wanted them to be the exact same every time. And that's what led me to do my B plus by grain to grain for 10 years straight. Uh, so it was basically a clone culture and never changed. Wow. Uh, but, but now I'm starting to, I'm starting to want to explore these things again. So I, I just, I just ran through a few of them, made some prints. I've got uh, a couple of wild things that people have sent me. There's a, a wild South Carolina one that I've got on a plate now. Uh, there's a, a, a wild Louisiana that I've got to get started. Uh, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in these wild ones, like, uh, cause there's so much potential there. The, the ones that we grow that say they're from Cambodia, like I was saying earlier, they're not from Cambodia anymore. anymore they're, from, yeah. they're from New Jersey or wherever, you know, it's, it's, they've been grown in isolation and in captivity for a long time. And maybe they're doing the same thing that I was doing and trying to keep them the same, but they're, they're different from what's out in the wild. Right. And after my experience with this wild Mexican red sport, like I'm just, I'm stoked to try and pull whatever I can out of anything I can. Right. And there's, there's variety out there. Like any, any variety can end up producing a PE type mushroom. Like you just have to be there to catch it when it happens. All right. I had, where is it here? Okay. Uh, you've all wanted to know he was, uh, I couldn't find this earlier question, but he's curious about, uh, your substrate and uh what you put in it i do the i do the very basic uh the the damien 5050s bucket tech the the quar and verm mm -hmm. uh and water uh and that's it like i get popcorn quar and verm that's all you need the the the, the grain produces the the nutrients yeah. and then the the substrate holds the water uh, now you can do manure based substrates and the argument there is that the substrate is nutritious so you have potentially more food for your grow and you can get more flushes in the long run and more yield from a manure based sub right. but that also comes with more complicated uh trying to manage the biodiversity in the sub so you've got to pasteurize it properly uh and, and i think that manure based substrates are probably better lended towards your traditional varieties that grow outdoors anyway, because the introduction, when you introduce uh, bacteria into your grow, things get fucky, you know, your, your albinos come out with golden caps, uh, your, your apes come out looking like golden teachers, like weird stuff happens. And in a, in a manure based sub, if you're growing a classic variety, it'll probably just continue to grow classic because that's where it's at already, you know? So it's, it's, it, 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 there's different schools of thought on it. The people that are diehard manure people are going to be diehard manure people, just like the millet people, like they believe in it, mm -hmm. but they've also gotten the process down to where it works for them. And somebody that's just starting out, manure will definitely complicate things for you. Like right. it can be used effectively, but it's more challenging. It has to be done right. Yeah. So the, the quarverm, it's, it's simple. It keeps it simple. And that, that you know, it works. gives you a better yeah, chance it, that successful grow. Yeah. All right. I got one from uh socks there harder. Best way to clone a fruit without a flow hood. Best way to swab without a flow hood. Definitely with a sab. You want you want a still air box. Uh that's the best way. Now I, I, I talked about this a little bit on the Gene Pool podcast when I was first starting out. I didn't know about sabs. I'm not sure. I'm not sure if anybody did back then. Uh, maybe, but I wasn't looking it up either. I was just kind of doing everything from uh, from the old like '70s books. Uh, so my method was the the steam room method. Like I would seal up the bathroom, blast the shower on full hot until the room was completely saturated with steam, and then turn it off and then do work in the clear air after the steam settled. You'd have like a few minutes of of clean air where you could do your transfers. Uh, and, and I certainly don't recommend that because my, my contamination rate was probably between 40 and 50%, uh, but I still got a lot done that way. Mm -hmm. Uh, but eh, sab is better if you know how to use it. Uh, and, and you can expect when you first use the sab, it's not going to cooperate with you because you got to get that practice down. Uh, the, just your hand placement, use tools, uh, trying to move very slow to not stir up air currents. That's always because I like to do a lot of work and I like to hurry. So working in a sab, that was the hardest part for me was just moving in slow motion, 
you know, like just because you just don't want to make any win. Right. You don't. But but uh, you can you can do it. Uh, you can swab without a flow hood or, you know, because the, the, the mushrooms themselves are not sterile. Uh, but but then the, the longest they're sitting out exposed, then the, the more chance that some dust or something is going to settle on them. So yeah. so doing them in the sab is better because it at least keeps them in a closed environment. So what I would do when I was using my sab, I would swab the fruits and leave the swabs sitting up in a in a cup with the swab tip up so they could dry a little bit. And then I would just kind of close up the sab, like cover the holes and just let it let them sit in there and dry for a while before I would package them up so they wouldn't be wouldn't be moist. So there's things you can do to improve your your likelihood of success, but at the end of the day, right? And, well, and if I'm just doing be it, really strong, you know, when I'm just if I'm just doing something for myself, I'll I'll swab a fruit in the tub, like I'll just swab it and take it and yeah. go drop it on some some agar. But but when you're producing swabs for retail, like then now you got to think in the long run, like the more of them that fuck up, the more I'm going to have to resend. And it's, you know, it's a process and it's time and it's money. And it's, so you want them to be as successful as possible, you know, so that, that you reduce the risk. There's always going to be a chance of contamination. And, and I mean, you could give somebody a perfectly sterile swab and they could contaminate it using it, but of course. you know, yeah, just, you just want to cut down as many of those risks as possible. Um, somebody wanted to know, and I was going to try to pull it up here. Uh, the name of that, uh, the new autoclave you're using. Oh, uh, it's it's on Amazon. The brand name is MX Moon Free, like MX Moon Free. Uh, it just, you know, a lot of Chinese companies take English words and kind of Lego them yeah. together to make brand names that don't make any sense. Uh, because they think, oh, it sounds American. They're going to buy it, you know, and and sure enough, we will. But uh, yeah. it's MX Moon Free. There, there are a couple other brands that make the same. It's like yeah. the same equipment with different brands. And do you have the 18 liter? Yes. Okay, I just found it here. And that one holds, it'll hold five quart jars, or I've got some some uh, pint and a half jars that are like their quart jar height, but their pint jar width. And I can squeeze one of those in the middle. So I can I can fit five quarts and one pint and a half jar in the middle. And uh, that's the one, yep. There you go, guys. So yeah, this company, they make a bunch of different sizes. Um, I've been pretty tempted to buy it. Well, and you know that that initial price tag is is pretty high compared to a pressure cooker. It looks like three pressure cookers. Yeah. But it, when when it comes down to the speed at which you can work with this thing, it's yeah. phenomenal. Like it, it really it really makes a difference. If you're doing like, and even though it only holds you know five or six jars, I can do three batches of grain in the time it took me to do one in the in the twenty two quart. Yeah. All right, let me get that off. Okay. Some people probably have a 23 quart. Uh, it's a Presto. Mine's a mine's a Miro and they make a 22 quart. They shorter me a mm. quart. Hey, I bet you fit the exact same <laughs> amount of bags and jars in there as I do. So Yeah, it makes it make that one quart doesn't make any difference. No. Um okay, you sort of answered this, but here I'll I'll put it on. Do you plan on growing any other psilocybes besides Cubensis and the Tampanensis you already mentioned? Yes, I'm just not ready for it yet like i've i've got all these different spores i've got like a whole slew of different ones that i i picked up in trades from new zealand uh just a lot of weird exotics and i'm gonna have to do a lot of research and a lot of tinkering to get the the growing methods down because i just i haven't grown a lot of them are wood lovers so i mean standard wood lover stuff applies but nothing grows like that in my area like I have zero psilocybin naturally occurring in my area. So like, I can't just throw wood chips in my garden and expect it to work. Like I'm going to have to build something to to yeah. maintain proper conditions for it. I just got a Lenny and I'm thinking the same thing. <laughs> yeah. Like I got it, but now I got to figure out what I could actually do with it. Yeah. I get it. Well, and, and some of them I don't think have been grown in captivity at all. Like some of them yeah. are just, they're legitimately just like wild prints of yeah some neat stuff uh but the the wereroa is is on my is on my list like i've got culture of that mm -hmm. going and that's probably going to be my first my first wood based one that i'm going to try and work with yeah speaking of wood based uh there's a guy in my discord he's also on yoshi's discord he goes by holofractal uh, yes i'm going to seen some of his stuff 
just just booked him so he's going to be on an upcoming podcast i'm really uh, excited to see if nothing else man just seeing these guys pictures are uh really cool so i'm yeah, hoping I, to learn a lot from i've him. really loved everything i've seen that he's done he's doing some amazing yeah. things i'm gonna definitely tune in for that one too he, that's gonna be a good out show. of the out of the box thinker which i i always appreciate yeah well and that's how we find out new stuff you know like mm -hmm. there's 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 the whole like follow the tech school of thinking where you have to follow these rules, but, right. but that's just to get your, get that's just to get your feet wet. Yeah. That's, that's to get you success in the beginning. Mm -hmm. Like everybody's growing environment is a little bit different. So like following a specific recipe isn't going to give the same results for everybody, you know? So it's, it's just, you have to, but you have to start somewhere and you want to start with yeah. success and then build on that. Yeah. Uh, Cause building on failure is uh, that's a lot of poking around in the dark you know <laughs> that's what i tell i tell all the newbies i say i'm telling you right now if you go and buy a thousand dollars worth of gear and you fail out of the gate it's going to be really disappointing so get yourself some grain spawn get some sub and a box and just have have a flush so you see what that feels like and, yeah keep but well, just keep it simple yeah. and, and Everybody wants to to have like the the full canopy thing. Uh, don't don't count on it. You know, sometimes you get lucky, but don't count on the full canopy because that takes a while. Like you see, uh, Michael Clay is probably yeah. the king of the full canopy. He does these these massive ninety quart tubs, and only very rarely have I seen like a a spot where you could have fit one more mushroom in these things. Right. You know, he's got he's got his process down, and and he's just he's very very particular about how he does it and he does it right yeah but starting off like don't don't start off with a 90 quart tub like <laughs> no when you turn that whole 90 quart tub with two buckets of choir in it like green like you're gonna be really sad yeah i Maybe. see the 90 quart tubs and i'm just logistically like yeah that's it's too much it's too much for me i, I don't know i don't I, I wouldn't have any place to put one it's there's yeah. not enough room I hear you. All right, Although, man. Actually, well, I do have some hedgehogs that live in 90 quart tubs. So I guess I could get rid of I some was, hedgehogs. I was going to say, I think if you had a 90 quart tub, I'm thinking there's a pet that's going to probably end up making its way in there anyway. So yeah, I had, I had a 120 quart sab, uh, it was a nice big sab. My first one was 60 quarts and it was way too small. Uh, mm -hmm. it worked, but you just couldn't fit very much work in it at once. And so like, the process of taking things out and putting things in it's just it's time consuming you know so the, yeah. the more space you have the better but uh that ended up being a, a nursery for my guinea pigs when they had babies there you go and i yeah i, I just want to say for for people tuning in who have not interacted with with dave or haven't seen uh what his posts look like besides amazing mushrooms um the guy is an animal lover and uh, I, I really respect it. And it's always uh, an occasional moment of Zen for me to get to watch some of his videos of feeding his squirrels, um, which initially I was very impressed how, how tame your squirrels were. And then I found out uh, some of their, what some of their diet included. And, and I, they're, they're enlightened. <laughs> yes. They, you, <laughs> you have some enlightened squirrels. They like, you are probably their God. Which I, I actually I opened my back door this morning and I had I had a few fruits popping up in my dump pile, uh -huh. uh, which is rare because usually they pull all the popcorn out of it before anything can grow. Right. But I did get a few fruits up, and when I opened the door, I spooked a squirrel and it took off running with one of the mushrooms in its mouth, uh, that's and hilarious. it took it like all the way through the neighbor's yard and up a tree somewhere, like still holding on to wow. it. So uh, they don't just eat the popcorn; mm -hmm. they're taking the fruits too. Yeah, it, it, those those videos are fantastic, man. I love seeing those. Um, all right, so we're two and a half hours in. Um, that's probably I, I think, that's probably I about think, our limit. I think we're going to call it. We had a good time. We can, of course, do this again another time. Uh, I want to thank you so much. If you guys don't follow Dave, go to Facebook, Dave Wombat. Um, easy to find. I don't. I, I don't believe you have any other Dave Wombat competitor wannabes, do you? I don't think so. The, no, I, now, now my group, my my Wombat Labs group is currently hidden because after the last podcast, we had such a huge burst of, of member requests that 
uh, we were having like my, my admin team was having like mental breakdowns dealing with it. So, so I, I hid the group for a little while to, uh, to calm things down, but I'm going to go ahead and switch it back to visible again so that anybody that's tuning in that isn't in the group can check it out. Uh, and, uh, yeah, look for uh, wombat labs, LLC is the name nice. of the group. It's a great group. Uh, very low drama. I've not seen any drama though. I imagine behind the scenes you occasionally do. Um, There's probably a little bit, you know, but we just we just try to stay focused on the the task at hand, which is mushrooms and the love of mushrooms and the love of everything mushroom related. Like, I'm not I'm not hung up on them being psilocybin mushrooms. They can be they can be oyster mushrooms. They can be mushrooms you saw outside somewhere and took a picture of. I love mushrooms. Yeah, cremony. You could draw a mushroom with crayons and post it. Like I'd, nice. I'd love to see it. Awesome. All right, man. Well, thanks again. It's been a pleasure. I've learned quite a bit. Uh, hopefully everybody else uh, get, got a taste of what makes you so special. And, and if you guys have not, uh, I really encourage you to go on to Facebook and uh, connect with Dave. He, he's got, if you're ever getting bored with the genetics you're working, all you got to do is knock on his door and he, he's going to liven things up for you. I, I do actually, I, I sold uh, my entire menu recently a couple of times wow uh but uh there's going to be some new ones mm -hmm. uh, added to it before long anyway so perfect but i i, I think i think uh i think the last one that i sent out was like 81 different wow. varieties uh so that guy's going to be busy for a little while yeah uh, i think i think some people once they finally get a hold of you they go oh my god i i mean i gotta get this i gotta get this i gotta true. get this that yeah. does happen. Like yeah. uh, now that I've got you, give me everything yeah. Yeah. so that I don't have to go through this process again. And it, yeah. I don't, I don't mean to be inaccessible. I'm just, I'm just busy on yeah. the move. And my message box is full of, there's like people asking uh, growing questions all the time. There's just, there's yeah. a constant flow of messages and you can get lost. Like you can just get buried. Like uh, yeah. easy. It's, it's tough. I need a secretary. Someday. For, I mean, give it a few years. I'm sure there's going to be like AI software secretaries you can buy for, you know, a few bucks a month or something like that to do. That wouldn't be too bad. Work. Yeah. Well, but that's that's what what's kept me from uh, doing the website thing. A couple of people have asked, like, well, why don't you have a spore website? And it's just that I, I'm I'm juggling a million different tasks, and if I had a website where people could just place orders willy nilly, I'd spend all my time filling packages, and I'd never get anything done. Yeah, so you probably would. So, so the, the self-limiting on purpose. Yes, it yeah. it helps. I I spend I definitely spend more time working on mushrooms than I do selling the spores for them. Like I, I, I well, that's good. That's good. Well, yeah, it's that's 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 the important part. Yeah, I guess that's the important part. Cool, man. We've got we've got uh, El Choco. I I just swabbed El Choco and produced like I think I like 150 more El Choco swabs. Wow. And I. I I don't really sell very many of those, like, but I, I've got them for the apocalypse. When the apocalypse comes, uh, hit me up for El Choco. I will have oh, it. I, I'm, I'm sure you're going to get a little boost in El Choco orders. Don't, don't you worry. It, it's kind of a, it's, it's kind of been my sleeper variety. Like I, I, everybody's interested in Jack Frost and the albinos and stuff. And then, and then they see this dark one and, and people are like, Ooh, ah, like it's really dark, but nobody wants it for some reason. I just, I don't, oh, I don't know. It, I, I already got it from you because I like it. <laughs> I tell everybody about it because it's just it's different. The the Jack Frost, there are other things in the vein of Jack Frost. And while Jack right. Frost is awesome, um, I yeah, I, I like the super unique KSS S Al Choco. I don't well, like Prinkle. I don't think you sent me that one. So I might have to be getting that one soon here. I I think I have the albino one, but I'm out of the regular one until the next batch comes up. That's, that's cool. We'll, we'll talk. That is okay. <laughs> yeah. All right, man. Well, thanks again. Um, it, it was a pleasure. You are uh, oh, wonderful to talk with. And maybe we'll get you on uh, for some, uh, we didn't really get into too many trip stories. So maybe we'll have to, we'll have to get you on some more, more experiential uh, content. We can definitely do that. All right, guys, we took a little walk down memory lane, little, little podcast archive trip little rerun, little geeky reruns. Um, 
if you guys have never seen that episode, I'll give you a minute. I know your minds have just been blown and you're going to, you're going to need a bit to absorb it all. If you've seen it and you hadn't watched it in a while, I, I hope it revitalizes some thoughts and some, some things you might want to try in your uh, cultivation practice. Even if you are a relatively new grower, I feel like there's plenty of stuff that Dave was talking about that might inform how you start looking at your tubs and, and what your next steps are going to be. When are you going to go back to spore? Are you always going to just be chasing a clone of something? A um, lot of good information tonight. Hope you guys uh, like, like checking that out again. And for me, it's, uh, I, I figured I can just slap this thing on, onto uh, the audio podcast or, or we can just re-air this. So I was like, this is a good one. Let's re-air this. Anyway, hope you guys like that. Um, stay tuned next week. We, we got a couple interesting people. We're going to chit chat about some recent events in, in the Myco world and, uh, should be a good time until then go grow some mushrooms.